or we see uh, requiring that masks are worn in all indoor public settings, regardless of vaccination status, through February 15th. Uh, we do have a limited overflow meeting room with a te television monitor that will be available um, if the main boardroom needs capacity, which it's not right now, um, and the meeting will be live streamed on our YouTube channel. So for members of the public who would like to address the Board of Education on items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board, please make sure you see a staff member uh, where you came in and they will assist you. Uh, as I mentioned, Mr. Kinnear, our board clerk, is absent, so I'll ask uh, Ms. Mrs. Martin if we have any cards submitted with requests request for members of the community to provide public input on closed session items only. And it looks like I have one card. Uh, so before we adjourn to public, se uh, or public uh, closed session, I'm sorry, uh, we will hear from Christina Kendall. It's Christina. In the, there you go. Feel free to come up here to the podium. When you get here, you can put the push the button, and that will turn your mic on. And you have three minutes to address us on uh, any matters on our closed session. Um, thank you. Um, Make sure you I, speak right into the oh, microphone. Uh, dear board members, I implore you to vote for Candace Reed. Um, she really is, and not what the media has created her. Candace is a kind, loving, pure, trustworthy, giving, forgiving human being. She gives tirelessly of her time, intellect, and energy to support her family. Can you speak yeah, right into the mic? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. She gives tirelessly of her time, intellect, and energy to support her family, friends, and students. She believes wholeheartedly that all people are a work in progress and given the right guidance with love, compassion, and wisdom can achieve great things. It is that core belief that led her to become a teacher over 20 years ago. She has always been available to listen to the burdens of others and offer sympathy assistance and support. She is a great listener and confident. It breaks my heart to see and watch her having to endure all of the hatred and ridicule that's coming her way. If I could speak for her, I know she would say she is immensely sorry that her student was offended by her attempt to engage and entertain her class. There was no evidence of maliciousness, meanness, or hate. In a more perfect world, this lesson should have resulted in an honest conversation between student and teacher. The student could have expressed what the lesson made him feel uneasy, uncomfortable, or conflicted. The teacher would have been able to say she was sorry that they interpreted the lesson the way that they did. Like that, and she would never want anyone to feel that way. As a result of this, she, she would never reference any culture in her lessons again. Should a person be condemned and lose their job over perception, not truth? Please take into consideration when you vote on the fate of this teacher, all of the years her life that she has dedicated faithfully to serving and di diligently ed educating the North High School community. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I did receive one more card, and this will end the public comment portion of closed session. Uh, Jesse Paulos. So make sure you speak right into the mic. You have three minutes, and push that button so we can turn the mic on. There you go. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board, for hearing me today. Um, I'd like to echo the sentiments of the, uh, of the last speaker. Um, I'm here also to shed some light on a growing fear among um, my colleagues and teachers. Um, as a math teacher at North High School, uh, I feel like I have some information that may be relevant to the decision that you guys uh, may be making uh, during closed session today. 
I know Miss Reed as a fellow math teacher. Um, I also know her personally as we spent many lunches together. Um, I also know the Sokotoa topic that has become such a controversy. Um, regarding Miss Reed as a math teacher, she carries herself professionally. She treats her job with respect. She's well organized. Her lessons are thoughtful and well designed. She maintains high expectations of her students, um, teaching many of our accelerated classes. Uh, she's committed and she's influenced over 20 years worth of students in her time at North High School, including my younger sister, who still to this day considers her her most favorite teacher of all time. Regarding Mrs. Reed as a person, um, most of our personal conversations revolve around our children, like most, uh, like most uh, parents. Um, she's the mother of three well-mannered and energetic boys. She's active and involved in their education. She's creative in dealing with their behaviors. She understands that each of her boys is very unique and she sets boundaries with her kids. They love her and they treat her with respect and every time that our kids have played together, they've always been polite and played well even though my kids are much younger. And I think that says a lot about her kids, which I think says a lot about her. My dad would always say that you'll know the tree is good by the fruit it produces. And Mrs. Reed is good and she's produced a lot of good fruit. And I know that she's involved in this controversy and I know that she's offended a lot of people, but I don't believe that any of that was intentional. Um, to speak to the lesson on Sokotoa, she was telling a story, a story that if you Google search Chief Sokotoa, you'll find over 15 videos. My teacher, an RUSD teacher, would tell the same story. There's precedent for the lesson that she delivered. Now I understand how she delivered it matters. But if she was here today and if she was able to speak for herself, I know that she'd apologize and I know that her intention was never to hurt anyone. I hope you guys consider this as you make your decision today. In the Bible, it tells us that he who is without sin can cast the first stone. I think we've all been guilty of unintentionally offending someone in our lives, maybe not as publicly as in Miss Reed's case. I think we should be given the opportunity to apologize and to learn and to move forward. It's a scary precedent for the current staff and faculty that we have if we set, uh, if, if we decide. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. That concludes the uh, public comment portion of the closed session. So we will adjourn to closed session at uh, 4.09 and we'll return at 5.30. Thank you.
right, good evening, everybody. It's 5.30, so we'll return from uh, closed session. Uh, welcome to the January 13th board meeting. Happy New Year, first meeting of the year. This meeting will be live streamed on our RUSD YouTube channel. And if you'd like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today is held in person here at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. We'll be following the current state and county health and safety guidelines. The CDPH order that was issued on December 13th, 2021 and updated on the 6th, 2022, it says 2021. The California Department of Public Health is requiring that masks be worn in all indoor public settings, irrespective of vaccine status through February 15th. A limited overflow meeting room with the television monitor will be available if the main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on our YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the Board of Education on items of business to be gen transacted or discussed by the board, please see a staff member uh, at the entrance where you came in. They will assist you with getting you a card. Uh, we did, the board did take action on two items in closed session. In closed session. Um, the board took action in closed session to approve uh, charges for dismissal against the following certificated employees. Employee number 115661, the unanimous vote, and employee 186182, the unanimous vote. President. Uh, Lee, I just want to note that it, it wasn't unanimous because we had a board member absent. They, they have, we have to note that the, which board member was absent. Unanimous for the people that were here. So yes, it was 4-0. Mr. Mr. Kinnear is absent this evening. Uh, with that, uh, that's the conclusion of the, the actions that were taken during closed session. So we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag will be led by two sixth grade students from Alcott Elementary School. Savannah Barajas and Brayden Dorsey. And it's uh, via video. Hi, my name is Savannah. And we are both sixth graders at Alpha Elementary. Our teacher is Ms. Turner and our principal is Mrs. McAndrew. And hi, my name is Brayden. I'm the youngest of four siblings. Will you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Have a great day. All right, thank you so much to Savannah and Braden and Alcott for, for the pledge. Uh, next, we will have a student performance uh, and this will be provided via video and this will feature Lauren Stewart, a fifth grade student from Mountain View Elementary School. Hi, my name is Lauren Stewart, and I won this year's Cinema Cultura Film Festival with my film, Can You Imagine It? I was so honored and blessed for this amazing opportunity. I had so much fun at the red carpeting event. My film was showcased along with other filmmakers. For the last two years, I've been participating in Cinema Culturas and had a wonderful experience. I can't wait for our next admission. Like I told Dr. Martinez, let's get this party started. No puede esperar para mi siguiente presentación. Como le dice la señora Martinez, comenzamos esta fiesta. Gracias, and thank you, and goodbye. My Fifth of King's dream inspires me to imagine a world where we wouldn't have to be judged by color, beliefs, and or who we fall in love with. Can you imagine it? There'll be a world where we wouldn't have to broadcast that black lives matter or that Asian lives matter or gay pride matters. This wouldn't happen at all because we would know that everyone's important and that we need each other to make this world a better place. Can you imagine it? Puede lo imaginarlo? The senseless killing of Dante Wright, Rashad Brooks, Daniel Prude, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Atatiana Jefferson, Stephon Clark, and many of these senseless killings would not have occurred. 
I keep imagining change happening. And you know what? I'm going to be a part of that change. I imagine that I'm going to be a lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, señoras y señores de la jurio, but I imagine even more. I imagine that I'm going to be a judge. I can hear it now. Please rise for Judge Lauren G. Stewart. Or in the court, you may all be seated. Or in la corte, todos will tomar tu asiento. Uh, oh yes, a change is coming. I can imagine the world as a more just place where we work hard and make a difference and not having to worry if my color, gender, or love interest would dictate my future. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? And can you imagine it? Puede lo imaginarlo, puede lo imaginarlo, y puede lo imaginarlo. Yeah, let's give Lauren a run. Yeah. I think that kid needs an agent. Um, all right, so, so thank you Mountain View and thank you Lauren for that. Uh, congratulations on that recognition. Uh, next, we will hear reports from our high school representatives. Uh, they'll be provided via video. Uh, first, we will hear from Alicia Dow from John W. North High School. Good afternoon, Board President Mr. Lee, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Alicia Dow, and I'm proud to be representing John Wesley North High School today. To kick off December, North hosted a Parent Information Night for incoming 8th grade parents and students interested in the IB program. The IB Information Night allows students and parents to learn more about the IB program and its benefits. North also hosted the Holiday Canned Food Drive. The school collected a total of 7,500 food items and over 5,500 pounds. These goods were donated to the Community Settlement Association's Food Pantry. The pantry is open to all families, no registration required, on Mondays and Wednesdays from 10.30 to 12.30. The United okay. Student League hosted an outdoor winter assembly that was split into two sessions. The assembly recognized winter sports teams and academics teams while having performances from dance, pep squad, and even a visit from the Grinch, played by Mr. Dean. In order to get our students in the holiday spirit while preparing for finals, Renaissance sponsored, which was the week before finals which consisted of holiday dress-up days, holiday socks, balalala flannels, holiday headgear, ugly holiday sweaters, and winter wear. Final exam cram was sponsored by the National Honor Society in which they provided after-school tutoring and snacks provided by peer tutors. The library was open for extended hours during final exams. On February 5th, North will be hosting our midwinter ball at the Municipal Auditorium in downtown Riverside. The auditorium is only 1.5 miles from our school, making it easy access for all students to attend. Ticket prices began at $20, with the theme of the night being Secret Garden. At the dance, the midwinter king, prince, knight, and squire will be crowned. 2022 to 2023 registration for classes will begin January 18th. Counselors will begin meeting with 9th through 11th graders to register for next year classes. Currently, our Husky Pride Day is scheduled for Thursday, February 24th. Administration is currently planning our annual 8th grade visitation day. Middle school registration of 8th grade students will begin following Husky Pride Day on February 24th. A special shout out to fall sports athletes who were named league MVP, cross country MVP Mackenzie Brown, football league MVP Venasio Michelere, football offensive MVP Asan Elliott, football defensive MVP Leo Tupo, girls golf Mandy Zhang was the CIF finalist, girls tennis MVP was Denise Campbell. To President Lee and Superintendent Hill and the entirety of the RUSD school board, we thank you for your dedication and commitment to the betterment of our schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, next, we have from Riverside Poly High School, Mark Ybarra. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. I'm once again pleased to be able to present to you all and share some exciting news and successes we have had recently at Poly High School. To start with, our brand new Pollywood Bowl continues to serve as an excellent addition to our campus community. With this, this new theater, we've been able to increase the events that we have held prior to our Christmas break. Between our theater and the bowl, we've hosted the Soapbox event for instructional services and at our holiday orchestra, choir, band, and theater as events, as well as a night of comedy sports. And since we are talking about performing arts, we hope to see you at this week's Honor Band event 
at Ramona High School. With the challenges of COVID, we have made the move to hold our assemblies outside and held our second assembly of the year right before our winter break. We held our winter assembly on our football field. At the assembly, we celebrated our athletic teams, performing arts, and announced our midwinter dance location. This year, our dance will be an entirely outdoor event at the Green River Country Club later this month. Winter athletics are off to a great start. Both our boys and girls basketball teams are ranked in CIF. Our boys is currently in the top 10 in the state and the third in, Division one, in CIF Division 1. And our girls basketball team is ranked 7th in Division 3 AA. Our girls soccer team is ranked 3rd in Division 3. And our girls water polo team is ranked 4th in Division 3. All of our other sports are doing excellent as we start league play. The Principal Central Leadership Group is another strong leadership group on our campus that works hard every day to bring positivity and to recognize students on all their achievements. Each month, our Principal Central Leadership Group celebrates our students of the month with a principal's breakfast. In December, 47 students were recognized by teachers for their outstanding citizenship in the classroom. This past Saturday, 50 students attended our Saturday SAT prep classes in our conference center. These classes will continue on Saturdays through the entire month of February. This past week was also our annual Poly Pride Week at Poly. All students reviewed what pride means to Poly students. Passion, respect, integrity, determination, and extraordinary continue to be our tenants across our campus and our community. As the college application process is slowly coming to an end, our counseling department continues to support our academics and well-being by holding FAFSA workshops for students and families to help students prepare for their post-high school education. And they are working with our underclassmen to make sure our students are prepared for their future. Thank you for allowing me to share about our beloved Poly High School. Thank you, Mark. Nice sharp tie. I think somehow you need to challenge Arlington in some kind of a contest. And if you win, I think the principal of Arlington should have to wear that tie uh, to school. All right, next from uh, Kiara Cueva from Riverside STEM Academy. Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. I'm Kiara Cueva, reporting on behalf of Riverside STEM High School. Starting off, December was the month of the holidays. In order to amplify the spirit and make sure everyone was able to participate, each class organized its own holiday donation. This included a clothing drive for coats and jackets and their involvement in the Adopt a Family program. With this opportunity, each class was, took the liberty of helping a family by donating holiday supplies such as gift cards, canned foods, stockings, candy, and soaps. Classes took their time wrapping these goodies during lunch and after school to ensure that each of the families would be getting a valuable surprise. On a more academic note, December was also a time for finals. Near the end of the month, students seemed stressed over the incoming tests. In order to ease this tension, the student body created a stress relief week. To spread the message and encourage the students to do well in their exams, inspirational notes were written and taped around campus, and hot chocolate and tea were offered. In addition, the Link Crew Club hosted a cookies and cram the Friday before finals week. In this event, students were able to study with their friends on campus with the encouragement of the Link Crew members. The turnout was surprising and students seemed receptive to the idea. On the final week of December, seniors practiced in a science fair exposition where they presented their capstone projects in a science fair format. Projects ranged from molecular sciences and math exploration to social behavior analysis and humanities projects. Seniors were able to exhibit their knowledge in front of the audience of students and teachers. They answered questions and were given feedback by the teacher judges as they were examining the projects. Some projects were able to enter the district sign up, which encouraged research in the capstone courses. Now, as we come back from winter break and begin learning in the new semester, the student body and other STEM clubs are excited to start activities back up again and provide fun and safe ex campus experience for students. This was it for STEM's report. I thank you all for listening and hope to be able to report more events in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cueva, for that update. Um, 
Next, we'll move to special recognition items. Um, this month, January, it's, it's a National Mentoring Month. Dr. Perez and the district have invited several esteemed guests with us this, this evening to share a little bit about mentoring. Dr. Perez. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. This evening, we are thrilled to be acknowledging Mentoring Month. During National Mentoring Month, we honor all of the parents, family members, teachers, coaches, employees, and community members, and so many more who devote their time, care, and energy to helping our young people thrive. This work is absolutely aligned to what we do in RUSD, provide, uh, providing engaging, innovative, and equitable learning experiences for all students. Tonight, we'll be hearing briefly from some of our partners and programs who provide mentoring to our students. After each presenter has shared a few words, we invite you to join them near the podium for a photo opportunity. Starting off with Alicia Velasquez from AmeriCorps, I will be reading just a few words that she wanted to share with us as she was unable to join us. The University Eastside Community Collaborative Youth would like to take this opportunity to thank RUSD for their long-standing partnership. Through your support and collaboration, UECC has had the opportunity to enroll 85 college students uh, annually as AmeriCorps members and provide tutoring and academic assistance to over 700 students. They have served at 16 RUSD elementary schools over the last three years. While AmeriCorps members assist elementary school students in increasing English language arts and math proficiency levels. Members also report how they personally have benefited from serving at these schools. They share their appreciation for the opportunity to be supported and supervised by principals, assistant principals, and receive direct guidance from teachers. Thank you to the RUSD board members for making these wonderful experiences possible. UECC highly values the collaboration and your continued support. Next, we will have Jennifer O'Farrell from Big Brother Big Sister, followed by Rochelle Kanatsar, Instructional Support Specialist for Heritage and Legacy Programs in RUSD, and concluding with Jennifer Foster, Education and Human Services Coordinator at John W. North High School. Can I just say that I want to be Lauren Stewart? when I grow up, um, but I think to, to pivot from my other remarks of with the agency's support and as shared, what would it be like if every kid, can we imagine if every student in the district had a mentor? Like that is what I'm walking away. Can we imagine, because what we could do together, and I think the beauty of the partnerships that the district has really funneled and that you have championed as the board and as staff have really created a community, a community whether it be volunteers, whether it be agencies, whether it be partners and parents and tios and tias, like I think we have created the village to support the students that we have at this district. And on behalf of Big Brothers Big Sisters and the thousand youth that we have impacted over our short eight years together, we are honored to continue to support the academic gap to increase the potential that we know is within every student, ignite it, and set them on a path to a, a positive graduated future with a mentor for their lifetime by their side. So thank you. We look forward to more and more years together in this time. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and RUSD Board. As an instructional specialist within the Curriculum and Instruction Department, I have the privilege to work with a team of individuals whose work is deeply rooted in the notion of mentorship. A mentor is someone who does more than just give advice. They are a non-judgmental person who listens with an open mind to steer you clear of the mistakes they themselves made. They help you in accelerating your growth by showing you a clear path with fewer distractions and obstacles. Since their creation in 2013 and 2016, the Heritage and Legacy programs through the support of this board have done just that, allowed us to champion for the district's African-American and English learner students. The 22 site contacts at our comprehensive and alternative ed sites have been blessed with the opportunity of mentoring thousands of students over the years with the goals 
of increasing graduation and A through D completion with much success. As Mrs. Gabriela Zlackett and Mrs. April Rodriguez, the legacy site contacts at Arlington High School put it, our sole purpose is to allow our students to see hope within themselves. Our USD board on behalf of our heritage and legacy team, thank you for allowing us to do the work that not only fills our hearts, but changes the lives of our students. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mr. President, President Lee, Superintendent Hill. My name and the rest of the school board. My name is Jennifer Foster. I'm the coordinator of the Education and Human Services Academy at North High School. And I have been doing the mentor program for about 10 years with my academy. Over the years, we've had on average about 45 mentors for our entire junior class every single year that meet with them throughout the school year, as well as doing a job shadow day where they actually get to go to their mentor's job and see what it's like on site. These mentors have been such a connection for our kids outside of their normal like teachers and family members and they feel like a lot of them are there just for them and they're not there because they have to be. And so these connections continue beyond high school. They get letters of recommendation, they network with them, some of them even actually work for them after high school too and just creates an amazing opportunity for these kids that they remember for the rest of their lives. Thank you for making that possible. So please join us as and uh, come closer to this area and our partners will join us and we'll get a few snaps. Thank you, Dr. Perez, for that, and to our guests, Jennifer and Michelle, and Jennifer Foster, and uh, Alicia for sending those comments, too. Um, next, we have our district superintendent comments. Ms. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Lee, and thank you to all our mentors and partners. It's a very important part of our student lives. Since our December meeting, I've had the great pleasure of doing classroom visits at Victoria Elementary School. Students were actively engaged in learning despite our current difficult conditions. And related to those conditions, you may have heard in the news that the state provided test kits for students. We were already in session when those tests arrived, which made it impossible for us to use them for the purpose of testing before returning to school. So instead, we have started issuing tests to students identified in contact tracing. We are also making the tests available to parents whose students are showing symptoms so that parents can test the students so they can return to school sooner. It's our hope that these two practices will allow students who are not ill to return sooner. This practice began this week and will continue until our supply of tests has been used up. Now I would like to offer my verbal update on the work we are doing toward equity, particularly in regards to Native American community. This past week, the RUSD Equity Task Force met to determine actions related to Board Policy 415 on equity. The policy calls for a review of nine areas in the district 
for example, professional learning and collaboration with local agencies. More details will come forward as the task force completes this work. In addition, we met with tribal leaders to begin to collect samples of land acknowledgments for the purpose of crafting one for use in RUSD. We are in the early stages of this process. Finally, I would like to take a moment to recognize our site, Classified Employees of the Year. These team members were chosen by their peers to be recognized for excellence at their work site. Congratulations to all of you who were identified and thank you for your much appreciated efforts on behalf of our students and the district. Thank you, Mr. Lee. All right, thank you, Ms. Hill. Um, on to section G of the agenda, which is public input. So at this time, if members of the public would like to provide comments uh, to the board on items to be transacted or discussed by the board, including topics that are not already listed on this evening's agenda, the board is limited in our responses uh, as the items are not on the agenda. Uh, yet we may be permitted to ask any clarifying questions of the speaker. Uh, so if you haven't already and you wish to address the board on items not on the agenda, please grab a card uh, at the entrance and pass it to a staff member. Um, thank you, Ms. Martin. Second. All right, so there's 10 cards, um, so we can do three minutes each. And we'll start with uh, Azeen Obashir, STEM education. Welcome, nice to see you. Um, good evening, board president, Mr. Lee, Superintendent Hill, and um, the board of trustees and the cabinet. First, I would like to start off by thanking the board for all they've done to keep our children safe and our schools open during these unprecedented times. I'm here with everyone today to shed some lights about the word STEM and our hope to embrace it in education and in the community. A few items we'd like to highlight is that during the last term of Riverside Council PTA, I, as the chair of the STEM in education and in collaboration with UCR's outreach team, we brought virtual science nights to three of the five comprehensive high schools during the pandemic. These were including uh, Ramona High School, North and Arlington. We also organized virtual stargazing nights and Cosmic Thursdays all online to reach our K through 12 students. As the Riverside Council PTA president, former treasurer and education advocate, and the mother of two children who have gone through the RUSD system, one continuing in a STEM discipline and the other disliking it, I have been in all sides of this opportunity. In our community, we sometimes tend to associate STEM education with a variety of items. We hope today to clarify that STEM education is independent and open for all. Even if it is out of curiosity, ultimately we want all students to feel empowered to achieve to their fullest potentials. STEM education should be considered in all schools with an RUSD and should aim to bring all enhanced learning opportunities to our schools and the community. We should be advocating for STEM disciplines that train outstanding doctors, engineers, and scientists, and believe this must be accessible to all our children, regardless of which school they attend. We hope to engage, educate, and enhance our student academic life and be a champion for all to continue their academic enrichment. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Natalie Brower, followed by Beth Ann Williams. Good evening. Um, I wanted to come again and speak about um, the COVID-19 procedures for employees. I'm a teacher in the district and I've come to speak every time, um, I'm here to speak for my fellow teachers and employees. Um, many are fearful of coming and speaking here and able to make it, so I feel like it's my duty to speak for so many. I don't want you all to think that um, the number of people here um, represent the concern and the concern level. I um, mean, kind of going back to my school site, I hear of 
um, teachers and employees coming and saying thank you for speaking and voicing our concerns um, because it's not just me that feels this way. Um, so I just wanted to be able to say that um, I'm very concerned with how things are being handled with the procedures for COVID. Um, we are very short staffed across the board. Admins are being pulled into classrooms to teach, which really opens up the district for you know safety issues with students. It's not the best use of um, their expertise for our schools. Um, and I, I do want to say again that the district continues to implement discriminatory procedures with testing only the unvaccinated, but also in its response. Um, I just fear with how short staffed we are, if this continues and then we continue to fire employees, like how are we ever gonna answer for this? How are we gonna save our district? Um, I've been exposed multiple times to vaccinated employees that do not have to test. Um, I'm very concerned that the district is not following union guidelines as vaccinated employees are not required to isolate when exposed or when they test positive on their own, they're allowed to come back to school sites, um, but that's not the isolation procedures that should be followed. I would have to stay home for 10 days if I was exposed or tested positive. Um, unvaccinated, uh, excuse me, I'm just gonna say that um, I know that the district has continually said that, um, I noticed that I think I yeah. only got two minutes. Okay. She's one more minute, if you guys could put one more minute. I need to start it, okay, thank you. Um, I know the district has repeatedly said that this is out of their Okay, <laughs> um, that there's nothing that you that you all can do as far as speak on behalf of students and families and teachers um, and employees. But I did want to read something that um, a neighboring district, our Corona Norco Unified, sent um, to Governor Newsom on December 9th of 2021. I just want to quote from a couple of lines that they expressed um, in their note to him. We greatly. We are greatly concerned about the education of our students moving forward and how to replace an already depleted workforce. We appreciate and share your commitment to keeping students in in-person learning as the best educational option. In closing, we are asking for your support in working with the legislator to ensure that, my legis that any legislation requiring student and staff vaccination for COVID-19 maintain valid exemptions for medical reasons and personal beliefs. In the Corona Norco Unified School District, we believe in the importance of sustaining safe in-person instruction for all students. So I mainly read that because... Thank you. You want to finish your thought? Yeah, that was three minutes. You want to finish your thought? You can now. Okay, I appreciate that. I just have spoken here many times. I reached out to um, Ms. Hill and that's the only response I got. This is a, a very concerning issue. It's very, very, very low morale on schools and I'm very concerned with what we can do just to voice our concerns. I'm not saying you can fix the issue, but can we do something to move forward with legislation? I just would like some answers Thank or you, some support. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Beth Ann Williams and then Sandy R. Do we have to present with the mask or we can have it off while we present? It's up to you. Oh, great. Here you go. Okay, great. Good evening, board. I'm here to talk about vaccine mandates. It is up to this board to recognize the truth about these vaccines and it is up to you to protect our children. The vaccines only suppress symptoms for a finite period of time. If this were not the case, boosters would not be needed. With every booster, you weaken your innate immune system that God gave you. With every booster, you increase your chance of adverse events and death. These are experimental, never before used therapies. Even Dr. Malone, who helped create the mRNA technology, is sounding the alarm to halt the vaccines immediately. Whatever short-term gain you think you will have with these vaccines is greatly outweighed by the long-term reduction of your health and your immune system. The University of Columbia just published their findings on a very detailed age-stratified study that was completed. It shows an unprecedented spike in all-cause mortality. Also, a huge Indiana-based insurance company has identified the same increase. A 40% increase in all-cause mortality has occurred between last year and now. 
and it directly correlates to the rollout of these vaccines. We are only just beginning to see the devastation these gene therapy vaccines are unleashing. These vaccines are an all pain, no gain wager. The vaccinated get and spread COVID just as readily as the vaccine free. It is now even being shown in the data that the vaccinated are proliferating it more due to antibody dependent enhancement. This is because when you inject yourself with a leaky vaccine, the spike protein binds but does not neutralize the cell and it renders the immune system more susceptible to future viruses and future illnesses. And this is per, uh, pro perpetuating COVID in the population. These vaccine mandates are the, in, the line in the sand for a multitude of parents. Parents are gonna pull out of public schools and you will see pushback like never before. Homeschooling is becoming the path forward as the public schools fail. Politics and funding cannot stand in the way of our children's health. It's time to take a stand for truth, not spare words. Parents and children are being gravely deceived. The government is hiding the egregious adverse events and death from these vaccines. This is the line in the sand for the parents who are not in the dark. Please protect our children from injury and death, and please vote these mandates down. Thank you. Yeah, San Sandy R. and then Janice Lutz. Thank you. The district is currently reviewing. Um, history curriculum textbooks. There's 13 textbooks available for review, and we've not even been given 30 calendar days or 30 um, business days to uh, review these textbooks. This was coordinated during the busiest time of the year when the district was closed for the holidays, and not people are very busy to go and review the textbooks or even take the time to read them from home on the digital copies. So I would request that that time frame be extended to allow um, further review for the parents that want to review those textbooks. Um, I'm aware that increased parental engagement in education isn't, um, is, is unwelcome thanks to the current administration's comments um, that we've heard, um, but we still would request our oversight. Uh, measure O oversight. The initial deadline, again, was given for November 12th. Six candidates applied by the November 12th deadline based on my records request. Um, the meeting on November 18th, Mr. Hunt said he didn't want to lose good people. Let's extend them for six months and agendize this. Same night, the district posted for more applicants with a new deadline of December 17th. Next meeting, December 16th, no agenda item for the oversight committee. Then the district posted again for more applicants, this time with no deadline, and finally um, followed their bylaws um, and actually ran the ad um, in the local newspaper for applicants um, as they are legally required to do so. This did not happen until after I pointed this out during the school board meeting. The intentions are clear that the district is doing anything it can to avoid certain candidates who wish to provide true oversight, clearly making many of us think that, Mr. Hunt, maybe you do have something to hide. Um, since going to such measures to prevent certain applicants from joining the oversight committee, there has to be a reason why. The district has um, not had any COVID updates um, in months, and the information uh, there hasn't been on the agenda in months, and the information on the website is very confusing. So many guidelines have changed and we can't be sure what the district is doing. Then some sections say 10 days and CDPH has been updated to five days for quarantine. Um, these are, um, there's too much ambiguity and um, when testing is required and when it isn't, um, clarification is needed. Guidelines need to be easily um, understood and accessible on the website. School sites um, were unclear how test kits were to be distributed. Policies are discriminatory based on um, vaccination status, which is another concern. Um, other districts have advocated to, for their parents um, parental rights. Um, Corona Norco, I know, sent out a letter, and the San Diego USD lawsuit applies to all districts that does not allow the mandate to be uh, applied while um, the appeal is pending. So we know that the mandate can't be enforced right now, but we would like to see that our district is also advocating for our parental rights. Thank you. Janice, and then uh, I think Chief Mike Negretti is gone, and I think it's Nicole, Jamie. Go ahead. Make sure you push the mic on. 
Uh, good evening uh, to the board, the superintendent, staff, students, parents, community members here and live streaming. My name is Janice Roots and I live in Ward 4 in Trustee Area 1. I'm also a co-leader of the California Anti-Racism Alliance, co-director of the Center Against Racism and Trauma, and co-founder of Anti-Racist Riverside. First, I'd like to commend RUSD for its current efforts in equity. Um, and I appreciate any time I've been given to have um, given an opportunity to provide input. Um, and I hope many, many, many more community members get the same opportunity. Um, from my perspective, critical race theory um, is not um, an issue at our RUSD. I think for parents and community members, the board as well, the real issue is not whether CRT is being taught. The question you need to ask yourself is, do I know enough about the history of race in America to ensure my child is, being, is not being negatively impacted by racism at my school? I don't know enough, and I spend 90% of my time doing equity work. Um, but what I can tell you is racism hurts us all. If you'd like to know a little more about that, read the book called The Sum of Us, what Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together by Heather McGee. But I'm here to actually challenge everyone in this room and watching to learn a lot more. I help host a two-day virtual course given by the Racial Equity Institute, who trains nationally, uh, that gives an accurate history of how we got where we are today as a nation regarding structural and systemic racism. If anyone needs a scholarship, I would happily provide it. Please let me know. You can contact me at CARA.request at gmail.com or antiracistriverside at gmail.com or here today. Um, in addition, Anti Racist Riverside is working on the implementation of the truth, racial healing, and transformation process, which was developed by the Kellogg Foundation. And we hope to reach at least 100,000 people in the city of Riverside and work with Riverside Unified as well as other organizations and large systems. Ensure that the conversation about race is not uncomfortable, even if it might feel that way, but that you can say those words because racism does exist. Um, last, I would like everyone to please learn all you can from every source before you decide how we can best educate our children. And I look forward to the day when all the... Thank you. <laughs> Chief, is Chief Mike Negretti, I think he... I got a note you left. Okay. Um, I think it's Nicole. Yes. Thank you, board members. Uh, Mia Natwanyane, Nicole Jaime, Kishanda Gabrielino, Indian and Coastal Chumash. Hello, I would like to present this letter that was written for Tribal Chair Negrete. He couldn't be present tonight, so he asked uh, me to read this to you. This is from a advocate for the California Board of Education Indigenous Education Advocacy, Sunny Tripp. He's located in Shasta County. Dear Shoshonda Tribal Chair, Chief Negrete, I write this letter and show of complete support for you, the Shoshonda people, and for the creation of the new Indian Education Parental Advocacy Advisory Committee. I am truly saddened by the recent actions that have happened and your traditional homelands regarding the math teacher Candace Reed. As I stated in our previous conversations, I feel and completely understand your frustrations regarding the math teacher's actions and the district's own responsibility for allowing that lesson plan being taught for over a decade. I, like many of our native tribes and people are praying that the RUSD school board and administration has used this time to come back to its native students and community with a positive 
decision that moves towards respect, equity, equality, and inclusion for all of its students. However, if that is not the case, I want you to know that myself as the Indigenous advocate is here to ensure education, equality, and justice with support of the ACLU of California chapter will be ready to stand by side by side with you and your students and your new Indian education parent advisory committee created by sisters Laura and Nicole Jaime, true native parent advocates located in the Shoshonda homeland, your friend, Sunny Tripp, indigenous education advocate. <laughs> Laura Jaime. And after Laura, it's uh, Tintilly Ray. Haku. Miha Natwanyane. Laura Jaime. Shoshanga Vit. I am Laura Jaime of the Shoshanga Vit Gabrieleno tribe of Corona, California. And I'm going to read you a prayer that was written by my tribal elder, Mia, of the Chumash um, Coastal Band. Grandfather up above, thank you for our family, for we are grateful to you for our relatives and our ancestors. Thank you for our health. We are grateful to you that we are healthy. Thank you that each day we wake to feel the breeze in our hair. For each day we wake, for each day we rise. For each day we feel the wind in our hair and the ground beneath our feet. Please give us the strength to understand each other, please. Make us strong, so that we may understand each other and to listen with our open hearts. For when we listen, using our hearts and spirits from the ones that are good, we listen, our, our good hearts and spirits grow. This, this is important um, that you guys pay attention to our community. We are reaching out to all of you guys, Jacqueline Perez, Renee Hill, and there are people that have been um, segregated out within our community, and that's wrong. There was a meeting yesterday that was held. Four people were involved, all tribal chairs. One person did not make it to the meeting and was not gained access to the meeting. Did any one of you reach out to him to call him, see what was the problem? My chief was not in attendance yesterday because of that very reason. Nobody responded to his emails or his phone calls, and that is not okay. This is Shoshonga Gabrieleno territory, our ancestral lands, and he was not at the meeting, the initial meeting. Now, I reached out to Jacqueline Perez before the meeting was held and asked for accommodation so that myself and others could be in attendance as well for this very reason. These things happen and they need to be prevented. Our community is taking action. We have identified what is necessary to move forward with you guys and any other school district in the area. And that requires an Indian-led education center, plain and simple. You guys won't be able to do any work in this area or in the region without that. That is a necessary component of what needs to move forward. We are advocating that. Our chief, Mike Negretti, is advocating for that. And we are gonna go forward advocating anywhere else that we can for that very measure. This county, Riverside and San Bernardino, do not hold an Indian-led education center. And that is vital to working with Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yep, time we get three minutes. Got extra time. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't. You're happy you're, you you can contact any of us via email and you're welcome to come back. You can contact us any any of us via email or through Okay, well I'm sorry, ma'am, your time is up. We have to go to the next person. No. Then we have to give everybody more time. Sorry. Cintilly Ray. Tilly Ray here. Thanks, Lon. 
Um, here, I was here to demand, you know, in behalf of the family that was affected by the Candace Reed incident, that she was fired. So we thank you for taking the right actions and uh, firing her today. Thank you for that. We're also here to demand that any other uh, people that were upholding her racist actions be also fired and replaced with professional, culturally competent, and respectful educators and board members. Therefore, we ask that friends of Candace Reed, who are board members, to recuse and step down because they were not able to fulfill their duties without bias. Everyone, we are witnesses, witnessing systematic racism in action, with Del Kilner being Candace Reed's friend, personal friend, taking vacations together, and then he gets to decide if um, he's going uh, to keep being employed. Uh, he was her, her boss for a long time, too. Mrs. Reed committed red face for years, and we found that this was enabled by the laziness of her boss, the principal of the t at the time, Mr. Mr. Del Kinnear, who was a board member, for not properly reviewing her lesson plan and failing to realize it was racist and harmful to her students' self-esteem and their self-image. The school board assumed Del Kilner maintained proper lesson assessments and performed reviews as he should have at the high school. But racism was happening there, and harassment of the students was happening there for years under his supervision. As you can tell, there are many failures that allowed for this to go on for as long as it did, and it needs to end today. Please, board members, do your part to stop this and uphold safe and culturally competent environments for our children and to also uphold the reputation of the RUSD, which, um, as we know, is one of the leaders in ending uh, segregation in schools. So you should be interested in upholding that too. We were surprised it took this long to get her fired. Um, we ask you to now take responsibility and adhere to the very policies that you created not just in words, but in actions. Uh, so we ask you to please uh, fire Mr. Del Kinnear as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Next, Shirley Tribble, followed by Steve Kahn or Taken. Stevie, I'm sorry, Stevie. Good evening. Hello, everyone. You know, as I'm sitting back there and listening to the last speakers, um, I feel really sad. Here it is, we're starting 2022, and we're discussing issues that we went along in, in, the, um, in the 50s and the 60s. We're going backwards. We are going backwards. And I don't know what to do. I mean, I was at North High School in 60, I graduated in 68. We didn't even have black history. We were not allowed to have a student, a black student union on the campus. We had to go underground. And yet we're still here discussing racial issues, what's not being taught in school. It's just frustrating to me to hear this every time we have a board meeting. But let me get to what I got to say. Um, I'm still waiting for updates on the reports of the money spent for construction of all the high schools. We were told that we would get a, a report on that. And uh, I, I don't know of anyone that has a report yet. And um, Mr. Hunt, you had said at the last board meeting, you were talking about uh, the update, the renovation of the field at North High School. And what year was that? 2011? Okay. Well, I'm now asking for a report for all updates and improvements done to all the high schools at around that same time, 2011. Because you were saying, well, you know, other schools didn't get things done, and you know, how, how are you going to say that? And also including in that report, I want to know if I want this report to include any donations 
how much and by who. Uh, we need these reports. We need an update so we can fairly understand that all the high schools are being treated equally. We don't want to, I don't want to ask for an audit. We don't want to go back that far. But if we can't get a report, then we're going to have to go to someone and ask for an audit. So um, we need these reports because then we can talk about the unfairness of what is going on with the high schools here in Riverside. We can't do that without finding out what has been done for all the other high schools. So please, please. Stevie? Good evening. My name is Stevie Taken. Hello, Dr. Fruk. Nice to see you again. I live in Ward 3. I um, graduated high school in Harupa Valley in 1997 when we were still unincorporated at that time. Um, and I'm a proud resident of Riverside. I am currently a grad student and of the Masters of Social Work, uh, School of Social Work at Cal State San Bernardino. And I am a counseling therapist intern for the Valverde School District, K through 12. I'm uh, here today to speak in response to a, an article that I uh, became aware of a few days ago uh, in the Federalist. Uh, which criticized or claimed that the school board is including language in certain programs to, in, uh, to increase equity, which includes oppression um, and discrimination, racism, claiming this article claimed that these are, this is the language of CRT. And I'm a little confused as to why they targeted that specific theory. Um, because that's also language that's used in oppression theory and systems theory, uh, feminist theory, just to name a few. Um, so they've singled it out as critical race theory. And I think the ironic thing is, is that if they had a, anyone who is that critical and not afraid of CRT had a cursory understanding of what that theoretical perspective is, they would understand the significance of the backlash that has happened throughout history. Because I'm just a grad student, a mature grad student, thanks for noticing. <laughs> but my cursory understanding that CRT is merely a theoretical perspective which takes a look at events, historical and current, which also includes racism. So to denounce CRT at all, or to be to use it as a, a boogie word, I think exposes the ignorance and the racism of the person who is criticizing it. I want to commend this board and this school district. I'm immensely proud of you. And I, um, I encourage you and I will vote to, for you to expand on equity in our, and racial justice for our students and our next generation, the next community members here, um, and drown out the white noise. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that concludes the public input portion of the items not on the agenda. So that takes us to item H, which is board member comments. And uh, Jordan, do you, mind, do you mind starting this evening? Um, yes, I would like to. So something that I've been working on with my fellow student board members is revising the process in which student board members become elected. Um, I had a meeting with them yesterday going over some of the specifics that we needed to go over. And I've been meeting in, with um, other students in the district for dress code meetings, revising the dress code, and also with Ms. Hill and just relaying information to other students in the district. And that is all. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. President. I do want to thank the lady who, uh, who offered the prayer from the chief. The line, give us the strength to have the ability, I think, to understand one another. Thank you. Uh, I also, it's great that we're going to be celebrating, it hasn't been mentioned tonight, but of course this weekend and Monday, 
We're celebrating Martin Luther King Day here in America. Um, and uh, 39 years ago, I, I'll, I'll celebrate it, but 39 years ago, my wife and I, as of this Saturday, didn't choose January 15th, uh, respectively for Reverend King, but that was the 64th wedding anniversary uh, of our grand, my grandparents. And, uh, and as I get older, it does remind me when the anniversary is. And, and gives me uh, the hope for where we're going. Particularly the, as the last speaker was talking about, as our young lady uh, gave her presentation today, not on the color of my skin, it's on the content of my character. I want to be, on behalf of my fellow trustees, I want to thank the Casablanca Community Action Group uh, for their kind recognition of the trustees and uh, uh, Superintendent Hill uh, in the, the work and in, in ongoing uh, to advance that community with a new school. We were invited to their annual holiday party, and I will treasure the plaque, the little plaque that they gave to me and, and to us each. Uh, to North High School uh, in tonight's uh, uh, agenda, I'm looking forward to uh, th that, deb that discussion tonight and formalizing the priorities of the projects uh, for that campus. As I committed to um, at our last uh, board meeting, trustee, I met Trustee Dale Kinnear the next uh, day over there and along with, and I thank her, Principal Jody Gonzalez. I walked the campus with them um, and uh, I was impressed, I was enlightened, and I was convinced, and also with the help from Doc, uh, uh, Superintendent Hill, information she provided. Uh, for the campus, and tonight I'll be going over some items that Dale and I, Mr. Kinnear and I agree should be the priorities, and he proved them out each time as we walked through there, and I, I'm, I'm uh, excited about that. Some last meeting criticized me, and that's fine, you know, uh, that I didn't vote for that amount of money to North until I went there to see this, and I do support it now. I went. Uh, and I've talked to uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Superintendent Hill about it, how to, I think, to present it. But um, also I want to thank the, uh, the science teachers and other teachers that we met on the campus. I uh, was very impressed with them and their input, and uh, uh, it's exciting. Lastly, as uh, president last year, in the fall of 2021, I made a commitment that I would pin a letter to Governor Newsom requesting that he... Uh, step to his gubernatorial podium and to strongly clarify for all that he and and uh, not only that he only he and not any of the school boards the 1037 school boards in this state have the authority where mandates are concerned i did write the, the draft of that letter i worked on it to keep it within one page it was hard to do for me yet in reviewing the final draft Looking over carefully, I determined that its purpose was irrelevant and nonsensical. I realized at that um, the one aspect that some in this room and outside do have in common with Governor Gavin Newsom and he with you is that the truth that Governor Newsom alone has the power to issue, amend, and rescind under the emergency orders given to him, emergency powers given to him by the California legislature, mandates related to the pandemic. To uh, Ms. Williams mentioned, and I respect her very much, but we don't have, no school district does, has the power to vote on a mandate. We don't vote on the mandates. We implement the mandates. And, uh, and we enforce the mandates. That is the only power that we have. And, um, but these uh, folks who want to come down here do so and, and push back against the truth for the singular purpose is my observation to detract and uh, to, to take these issues forward like the CRT in a political manner, self-centered, to advance their own agendas. Um, the personal tactics they utilized are disingenuous, divisive, 
and a distraction for this school district and all school districts uh, in this county and this state to do what is their purpose and their, and their mission, to advance education for our students, the community's children, and, and as the California Constitution prescribes, our number one of priority is to assure and maintain safe and secure campuses. The state of California has determined that masking and vaccines and et cetera are create a safe and secure campus. We are to implement and we are. Again, the governor possesses all the power, the school boards uh, implement, and uh, as previously, uh, none of this will come to as a revelation, I think, to anyone in here yeah, and, uh, or out there, what I present. This is the truth. Now, some folks do despise the truth, and, but you know the great thing about the truth is the truth doesn't care. The truth is the, is the truth. It will not be manipulated, it will not be coerced, and it will not change be, uh, just because some wanted to. The truth knows that an LEA, a school district, doesn't have anything to vote on with the mandates. The truth doesn't waver, as I said. The truth doesn't, the truth, uh, doesn't matter to the truth if you want to change the facts. Uh, the, the truth continues to move on. And it, again, it won't be manipulated or bullied into something else. And neither will I, because I took an oath to back the law and the truth. Uh, my oath of office guides me to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America and separately the California Constitution. Uh, and that's what I have done and will do if you're questioning what is going forward. To pardon a personal insight, the USA, the oath that I took up for the USA is the same oath that my father in 1939 took and kept for 24 years of service in the United States Air Force through three war wars um, defending the Constitution of America and our safety. I'm never going to stray from my dad's example and more importantly, the truth. And integrity and uprightness will preserve me, said the psalmist. I trust my position, and while not speaking for my colleagues, yet with confidence, none of them, I feel, would ever betray their oath either. They take it seriously, they work diligently, and, and, and with thought. Doesn't mean we don't talk about these things with, with our community, but we will stay with the truth. I thank you very much, Mr. President. Mrs. Allardy. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Our last meeting uh, marked the start of my 17th and final year on the Board of Education, as I will not be seeking a fifth term this fall. I was first elected to the board in 2005 when my youngest was still in high school, and she just turned 35, so that tells you. Since then, I have tried my hardest every day to represent the entire district, every school and every student, as it was when I was first elected as an at-large candidate. I believe that the work that we do on the school board is one of the most important locally elected positions there is. We have the opportunity to strengthen, enhance, and improve the very fabric of society, the education of our children. When we collaborate and communicate, we are very successful at making positive progress and consensus. When we don't collaborate, we do not make as much progress, and the progress we make is slow and painful. Because most issues are not black and white issues. They are multitudes of gray. One decision always affects many other decisions. Therefore, it should not be the loudest or the angriest to win arguments, but the measured and thoughtful reasoning by the entire board together with the superintendent's wise counsel. I will continue to be heavily involved this year as we journey toward recovery from the pandemic and from learning loss. We're off to a tough start with this uh, Omicron virus, but I believe uh, that we will beat it. We will be stronger and we will start coming out of this and it will be a good year for us. And I look forward to a positive year for the entire district and our city. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Valerie. Uh, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, I, did, I first just want to begin by uh, expressing my appreciation to my colleague and friend, uh, Kathy Alavi. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very significant commitment uh, for something that uh, is, is, is a very visceral and uh, you know, impactful experience in, locally in the community. And for you to dedicate such a huge portion of, uh, of, of, your, of your career and life to students and public education, it's an extraordinary thing. And I always appreciate that regardless of whether we agree on an issue or not, that uh, just your principles and your uh, uh, approach to going through your your processes is uh, something that we can all respect and learn from. So thank you. And I know there will be many opportunities, obviously, for us to recognize your service. So thank you. Uh, you know, I, I just want to speak to from a standpoint of uh, this compassion and empathy from our for our families, our employees, uh, with everything that's happening in society right now with the disruptions, the, the devastation that uh, this, the pandemic is wrecking on on all of our lives. And uh, I can't express just the, again, the resiliency, uh, how much, uh, uh, how much a, 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 a people are having to adapt and adjust to a, a very fluid situation where information is constantly changing and different dynamics are happening. And uh, our employees, our students, our families, they're, they're working through a very difficult situation. Uh, there's a few points I just want to particularly emphasize about it, but uh, again, my uh, deep appreciation for everyone's dedication on this effort. Uh, one is uh, I've been getting a lot of feedback regarding our dashboard in terms of uh, the totality of information that should be available to the community in terms of uh, infections and what's going on um, and for the, to help inform parents on decisions they're making. So I would just like, I know that we've had discussions about this offline, but I'd just like to have a better understanding on how our, our administration is uh, responding to those areas or how we're uh, improving it. Again, I know that there's an overwhelming amount of things happening all at once. So I know it's a difficult circumstance, but the data is very important for us to be able to make policy decisions accurately. Uh, another comment I want to make is, uh, you know, I know again with our employees, there's so many variables happening right now with people's health concerns, teaching, the uncertainty of what's going on, but uh, whatever we can be doing, like whether it's related to testing, uh, the protocols and process, whatever we can be doing to make things convenient and less stressful to accommodate, uh, I hope we're being as attuned to, to our employees and, and communities' needs on that. Uh, and if there's partnerships, more, I know that it's been like a month since our last board meeting due to the holidays, but um, I know we've been in regular communication with uh, the great leadership of our superintendent, Renee Hill, and the cabinet uh, throughout that process on where community partnerships, efforts with the state, the federal government, how we can be dealing with this in the meantime. But I hope that we can continue to provide as much transparency because for us on the dais, we're, we're aware of how much you know, day to day the responsiveness is going on, but the public is not always aware of you know, how all of this is being played out. The other point I want to mention is I think there's a lot of confusion to some families about why we are staying in school or why you know, we're not going to virtual. I think it's important for us to communicate also that uh, we're, these, dis these decisions are not being made by us in a vacuum. These are being done in consultation with state and county health officials, and those officials are taking into account the, the physical well-being by all the COVID safety protocols of masks and different areas to, uh, to provide ventilation and so forth. And then there's uh, emotion emotional and mental health well-being. There's academic uh, learning loss mitigation efforts. It's the totality of all of those things that are being factored into these things. It's not just looking at one specific thing uh, because we know that uh, there is no ideal decision that can be made in these circumstances. Any decision you make on one side has uh, trade-offs and we are absolutely uh, uh, making these decisions 
with the top state and county health officials uh, who are knowledgeable about these matters. And then I also got some comments regarding the uh, truancy uh, if, uh, uh, communications that, have, that go out when students are missing class. I know that, again, uh, uh, our administration has been responsive to, to some of the feedback I've shared about this, uh, but I hope that we can have some degree of, of con more of context that during this time, if, if, if kids are getting infected or, or mm -hmm. quarantining and uh, sick, that even if it's an automatic phone call and it's just saying, you know, that your student wasn't here, that that sometimes can compound in an already stressful time uh, where people are having to disrupt their work life from trying to make this work with their kids. So whatever we can do to be um, more thoughtful about how we message all of this uh, is appreciated. And again, just my deep and profound gratitude for everyone for everything they're doing to try to make this work given those uh, difficult circumstances. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, I know we've got a lot to cover tonight, so I won't make any comments this evening. Um, we did have a miscommunication with a public comment card about when this person should speak. So we want to make sure we give this person an opportunity to speak um, since there is some confusion. So we do have one more comment card from uh, Insaf Omar. You have three. Hello, you have three minutes. Make sure you push that button there. We'll start your time. You have three minutes. Am I on? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And I apologize for the uh, confusion regarding my comment. Uh, we opened up uh, tonight uh, talking about the imagination and the possibility of what it will look like for brown, black, and indigenous young girls to have an effective change and impact in our communities. But I wonder why we're talking about imagination when in the current uh, situation that we're in today yields results that continues to oppress people. Now we had people come in here today, indigenous people of this land, and they were cut off while someone else was speaking about wearing masks and COVID in school. They're in pain and they continue to be in perpetual pain. Meanwhile, the supervisor for Candace Reed is not here to be responsible to these comments. So I'm going to share uh, my solidarity with that com uh, community. Um, I am a doctoral student at the University of Redlands, uh, education in uh, social justice. And we spent a long time going over the injustices against the indigenous here in this particular location. Now, nearly 70,000 people had to get together to say that Candace Reed should be fired. Uh, plenty of people sent emails. But here's the thing, we talked about land recognition as if that's enough. It took me a long time to even have people recognize how to pronounce my name properly. Now we're talking about land recognition as some kind of form of justice. That's not enough. How are people being vetted when they come in to be hired? How are people being accounted for in their reviews? Was the supervisor to Candace Reed, Dale Kinnear, doing adequate uh, reviews of his teachers and to what standards because for 10 years to go under the radar with this kind of behavior shows a value within this educational system that seems to have permeated beyond just my generation but now in the youth that you show in these videos that are supposed to hype us up but to do land recognition that's performative what are the policies that are going to change how are we how are we going to ensure that this doesn't happen anymore and is the future dale or anybody else and hopefully their name will be something else because we believe in so-called diversity will they be doing their job adequately or will they be covering up for the next mess up we need accountability here for the future. My daughter, I've been in Riverside and San Bernardino County since I was young, and I went through hell going through these uh, school districts um, with uh, inadequate teachers who told me to go back uh, to my homeland and, and these kind of comments. That's not okay. And I won't have that for my daughter either. The board's policy that it passed in 2018 insists on non-discrimination. But how are you talking about, today we talked about equity through mentorship, we talked about uh, history and how that was reviewed rapidly without adequate review. What really are we doing here today? And do people have to constantly come to the mic to sh share their grievances and hope that leadership will take some action? It should be proactive. And your equity plan on your website that was supposed to be done in 2020 still says coming soon. So what's really going on? Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we'll um, hear from our district group reports, and first we'll hear from Ms. Laura. 
the Riverside City Teachers Association. Good evening, Ms. Bowling. Um, good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and school board members. I look forward to the time when, where I can speak to you about matters that are not COVID related, but unfortunately we are not there yet. In my comments to you last month, I asked for grace for our RUSD, RUSD certificated staff. And since that time, the work for our RCTA members has only gotten more difficult. As they are now dealing with a revolving door of students who have be, become ill or been exposed to COVID and need to be isolated. To say it has been a hectic couple weeks for our RCTA members would be an understatement. Our teachers and all the staff that support our students deserve our appreciation for all their hard work. On top of the challenges of having so many students absent, our RCTA educators are facing being exposed and contracting COVID themselves or have had to take care of family members that have fallen ill or have tested positive. Our staff with young children have had to use their own sick leave to stay home. With their kids, daycare or preschools were shut down for COVID-related reasons, or they were exposed in their own classroom. Many of our members are now out of out or are low with their sick leave. I've reached out to every member on the board regarding this problem. I ask you again to do the right thing by our members and extend this supplemental COVID leave that has been, but that was provided by the state under SB 95, but expired on September 30th. I also want to advocate for our nursing staff this evening. With the extremely contagious nature of the Omicron virus, they have been overwhelmed with work of following up on reports of positive cases and contact tracing, and they are drowning in order to keep everyone healthy and keep our schools open and fully staffed. It is important that safety protocols are followed and risks are minimized. One of those protocols is the COVID-19 public dashboard. It is crucial that that information on the dashboard be up to date and that contact tracing notifications are done promptly. The Cal OSHA requirements regarding contact tracing and notifications have not changed. To ensure those requirements are met, our nursing staff needs more help. A dedicated COVID contract tracing coordinator would be helpful as well as extra nursing staff at each school site to address the significant increase in COVID cases. Additionally, while COVID seems to have dominated everything else lately, we need to remember that our students have other health issues that require medical staff. Having extra nursing staff at the school sites will ensure all our students' need our needs are met. I urge you to please give our dedicated nurses and health clerks the support they need to keep our students and the RUSD community safe. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. Next, from Chapter 506, uh, California School Employees Association, Ms. Joy Hurst. Welcome. Thank you, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. As president of CSCA Chapter 506, I'm here today to speak, of our, to speak on behalf of our classified employees. First and foremost, I would like to express an immense gratitude for all the hard work, continued support, both from the cabinet and the board, of, board has shown to our students, our communities, and our classified staff. As you're well aware, these last few years have been some of the most challenging that we've ever had to endure. Every employee of this district has felt the strain of the pand this pandemic. From pivots in COVID protocols to worker shortages, our employees are working harder than ever. No one is immune to the stress and confusion that comes with navigating this new normal. In short, our members are struggling. I know the district is doing everything in its power to meet our staffing needs, as well as providing extra support in the interim. I'm so proud of each and every district employee for the dedication to health, safety, and education of our students we serve. Our classified employees are both the front line and backbone of the district. Like many of you, our members are tired, frustrated, and uncertain of what is to come. I am optimistic that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It is my sincere hope that the district and our union can continue to overcome each challenge we face collaboratively. We are, <clears throat> we are at our strongest when we work together to meet the safety, social, and educational needs of the students we serve. I truly believe if we have the same goals and work towards the common good, we can truly be extraordinary. Thank you. Um, that concludes our district group reports and brings us to the consent uh, agenda. All items listed on under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine 
and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will not be any discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board request specific items be removed from the consent calendar. Uh, Ms. Martin, do we have any cards submitted with requests from members of the community to provide comments on any consent items? Okay, great. Does the board have any items they wish to pull before we vote on the consent agenda? It's 19. The 19. We have a card. Okay. Give it a second. No. Something else. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion? But we're pulling nine, though, right? Yes, you need to pull nine. Okay. Item number nine. All right. So, Mr. Hunt, do you want to I, I pull would, item? Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. Outside of number nine, which I like pulled to approve the rest of the consent calendar. Okay, perfect. So we have a motion to um, approve consent calendar items J1 through 8. Um, can the board please vote? I second. Uh, and uh, Dr. Farouk seconded, I'm sorry. All right. Just one more member needs to vote. Oh, she's abstaining. Oh, the audio is showing up for some reason. Okay, um, perfect. So that carries. I'll take a motion now for item J nine. Yes, Mr. Lee, I would, Mr. President, I would be very pleased to um, recommend uh, and move to approve uh, number nine the rec uh, that has to do with personnel assignments. Therefore, our our fines, uh, a student member cannot legally vote on those. But I would move so. So we got a motion for J9. Do I have a second? Second. This is Alavi seconds. Uh, can the board please vote? That also carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you, board. All right, so that concludes the consent calendar. That takes us to K, which is action. Um, item number one, Ms. Yabara. Take it away. Good evening, President Lee, Ms. Hill, and members of the board. Tonight we bring to you a recommendation to the Board of Education to approve the extension of the employment agreements as referenced in section 7.1 of each of the contracts from 2023 to 2025 for the following assistant superintendents. Dr. Ryan Lewis, Dr. Jacqueline Perez, Aaron Power, Sergio San Martin, and Kylie Ibarra. Again, this amendment does not change any of the other sections, but only pertains to the extension of the end date of the contracts. All right, um, Ms. Martin did give me one card from the public on this. Is that any, anything else, Ms. Ibarra? So that okay. is that for that. Perfect. Okay, so then we'll hear from uh, one member of the public, Sandy R. On item K1. Yeah, uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, this item should not have been um, voted on tonight since the district failed to post or provide the entire contract for the public per government code 5262, um, which reads. All contracts of employment with the superintendent, deputy superintendent, um, associate superintendent, and various other positions um, shall be ratified in an open session of the governing body, which will be reflected in the governing body minutes. Copies of any contracts of employment, as well as copies of settlement agreements, shall be available to the public upon request. That request was made, and I was told I would not be receiving it. Um, Senate Bill. Um, 1436 went into effect on January of 2017 and amended the Brown Act requiring discussion or action regarding salaries and benefits and that should only occur at regular meetings in an open session. Um, you shouldn't be extending the contract and not providing the full contract as part of the public record. The reason that this change came about was because of what happened in the city of Bell with regards to contracts. Um, extending a contract out for three years, you should have made the entire contract available to the public. Thank you. 
All right, that concludes public comments on uh, item K1. I'll open up to the board if there's any questions for staff. Dr. Farouk? My question is, my question is this, this information, the contracts are, should be available to the public, right? The con contracts are current, they're in the public domain there with the board meetings where they got approved. And um, we did have a request for contracts today and we will provide the contracts or the links, but we did not pro provide them today. Um, they will be provided. So the board does know all sorry schedules are posted on the website. Yeah, but they're with the, with the district thing. They're not like aggregated. And the amendments for the term were posted because that's the only thing that's changing is the term. Correct, just 7.1 term. Anything else from the board? And, and Mr. Hunt? Yes, and, and Superintendent Hill, this is the true up, so to speak. The different contracts, so they're we don't have someone with a two year and some with this and some with that. And if I recall, in fact, I do recall, uh, under California law, it doesn't not matter how long a contract is for a public or event, it's only enforceable for one year. So, just to for my own knowledge base, Mr. Hunt, I can speak to the first part, not the second, yes, but yes, it does uh, have the cabinet members all then ending in the same year. Yes, ma'am. Um, and the other part about the year, I, I don't have personal knowledge of that. Good management practice. Thank you, Mr. Barr, for bringing this forward. Anything else? Tell me. I will move for approval of those extension of contracts. We have a motion for approval. We have a second. Uh, Mr. Hunt, we have a second. Please vote, board. Guessing, yeah. yeah. Our student board member, I think, has to abstain on. Yeah, because of. She did abstain? Uh, she should she be listed as abstain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind changing your vote? If you could or verbally just attest that, please. Yeah. Sorry about that. We should have given you the heads up. We're not allowed to go to that. All right. So that's uh, K1. That will take us to, I think, reports and discussions. You should just. Have her that just for the record, oh. from her directly. Jordan, would you mind just turning on your mic and just saying that your your vote on K one was abstention? My vote on K one was an abstention. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so that will bring us to reports. Is, is the board okay? Does the board need a break? Or you guys want to keep going? Okay, we'll keep going. All right. So uh, look at that. Mr. San Martin is right there, ready to go kick off this item. Go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, Board of Trustees. Tonight's presentation is a follow-up from the October 7th board meeting, Board of Education meeting, <clears throat> which, uh, in relation, was, which was in relation to the North High School uh, Capital Facilities Project. At the October meeting, staff pre presented an overview of the project's progress and introduced the design committee's recommended scope of work options. During this meeting, the Board of Trustees tasked project architect and the team to report back on project alternatives, reflecting the needs of the campus. The project is currently in the planning phase and soon moving into schematics. The purpose, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to report back on potential project options and receive input from the Board of Trustees. With us tonight is Ms. Liliana Bustos with Geo Architects. Mr. Jason Haworth with Tilden Coyle, Ms. Anna Gonzalez, Director of Planning and Development, and in the audience, also members of the Design uh, Committee. At this point, I'm gonna ask Ms. Liliana Bustos to step up to the podium and walk us through the rest of the presentation. As she prepares to walk, I would like to take a, a moment to thank the Design Committee. The committee's dedication and commitment through the last 12 months has been an invaluable part of the project's progress. We are grateful for their input and we thank them tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. Uh, like Sergio stated, we're back today with a few options for your input on 
what the architect and the construction team put together as options to try and uh, include as many of the needs as possible to fit within budget for your review and input. That said, we know we're looking at a total approved project budget of 61.5 million for the campus, which includes the 11.5 million for HVAC upgrades. Just to refresh your memory, this is what we brought to you in October uh, when we brought to you the options that were discussed by the uh, design team. Four options were discussed. One option was presented as a recommendation from the committee. And during that meeting, we received feedback from all of you and wanting to see additional scope alternates that included um, additional needs being addressed with the project. Those needs included more gymnasium options, uh, campus beautification with entrances, landscaping, shading, exterior painting, ornamental fencing, uh, science classrooms modernization, restrooms modernization, the replacement of portable classrooms, and library modernization. After receiving that feedback, then the architect that the construction management team got together and put together some options for your input again. Uh, and this is just a summary of the options you're about to see. And these starts represent what those options, uh, what boxes they check out of the uh, total needs that were identified for North. Uh, we'll start with the HVAC and lighting upgrades project, which uh, takes care of the classroom buildings. It also takes care of the library and the admin building. Uh, this project is going to include HVAC and lighting upgrades, as well as ceiling replacements, new painting and flooring, um, LED lighting, and fire alarm upgrades as required by code. And then we'll dive into the uh, different options. For option one, we are looking at the possibility of providing a brand new gymnasium that's going to per, uh, have a total of 1,200 seats. Uh, it'll have all the support functions that the program will require. And I'm moving to the next uh, slide, which uh, summarizes what those additional needs are. We're going, with this option, we'll be providing additional sitting capacity with 900 seats. Uh, the new building will also include a new lobby, Hall of Fame, restrooms, concession stands, ticket booths, team rooms, and check-in kiosks. Uh, as part of this option, we're including the uh, complete renovation and modernization of the uh, locker room building, which is a heavy level modernization. It's pretty much gutting the building out and just leaving the shell. Uh, and this, the project will also include site work to provide the beautification of the campus, the site improvements needed, um, shade, landscaping, irrigation, exterior painting, fencing, etc. cetera. Uh, all the options include the HVAC and lighting upgrades that we mentioned before. Moving on to uh, option two. Option two proposes to do a light modernization of the existing gymnasium and to convert the existing multi-purpose room to provide all the additional support spaces that are needed, such as the team rooms, the restrooms, the ticket booths, concession stand, et cetera. And this option will provide an auxiliary gymnasium that will uh, add a capacity of 350 seats to the existing gymnasium. Uh, it will also include the beautification of the campus and the modernization of the locker room. Uh, so the, the difference between the two options is one will provide 1,200, I'm sorry, 900 seats. The auxiliary room will provide 350 seats. And the main functions will take place in the new building with option one. And the additional functions will take place in the existing gymnasium by reconfiguring the multipurpose area. Option number three, we're looking at modernizing the existing buildings on campus and trying to do as much as possible to maximize the budget. In this option, we're looking at the full modernization of the classroom buildings in wings 200 and 300. It includes the modernization of the restrooms in those wings, uh, library and class classroom modernization in building 100, modernization of the locker room, and modernization of the existing restrooms and the gymnasium. It also includes a campus beautification front and back, 
site utility upgrades, uh, and the HVAC project that's uh, constant throughout all the options. With option four, we're looking at um, addressing the science classrooms. And for this option, we're proposing to provide a brand new two-story classroom building that will allow us to remove portables from campus. We'll be able to remove 12 portables if we uh, build a two-story classroom building. And we uh, consolidate all the scattered science classrooms that are currently located in building 200, 300, and 700. And then we can turn those science classrooms into standard classrooms and be able to remove 12 portables from the site. This option, again, includes the campus beautification front and back. It also includes site utility upgrades and the HVAC and lighting upgrades for the, all the classroom buildings. Option five will also be an option to provide a two-story classroom building, but instead of a science wing, it will be a standard classroom uh, wing. So we're proposing a couple of two-story classroom buildings that will provide 32 or 31 or 32 classrooms in order to be able to remove every single portable from campus and uh, maximize the budget by doing new construction without the need for interim housing. This option also includes the beautification of campus front and back. Uh, it also has the integration of the ag area into the uh, brand new two-story building. Uh, we have site utility upgrades, and then the site restoration and expa pro probable expansion of the parking lot if we remove the portables uh, north of 700 building. With that, we we'll move into option six, and this is an exercise we uh, wanted to bring to you in which we're addressing all the needs, itemizing every single need uh, with a probable construction cost for you to take a look and decide what will you prioritize from this list in order to stay within budget and come up with the scope of work for the North uh, High School Modernization or Addition Project. You're going to have uh, two slides that represent all the uh, scopes that we're looking at. And they're categorized under new construction, modernization, site improvements. Um, and then from there, I'll just uh, pass it on to Sergio and see how we're going to move along with this exercise and input we're going to be receiving from the board and for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. At this point, we can pause and have the board take a look at um, the option six, which was an itemized menu that uh, our construction manager and architect has provided to us. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we can pause here and take board comments or wait for public comments, or we can jump into a uh, exercise to look at kind of a, a choosing and seeing where where the costs may go and how it, this, in selecting different menus, it overall affects the, and staying us within the budget, the project budget of the 61.5. Well, Ms. Hill, I don't know if this is. If I can, if I can modify your direction a, a little bit, Assistant Superintendent San Martin, um, I don't know where the, the public comments come in. Where, staff where, report. Where, okay, wherever they're properly placed. Um, I would urge the board to take time to look at each of the five options uh and see does it suit your vision for uh the a comprehensive project as you envisioned it uh, and then can talk about uh the most important elements of the project because the the, the project budget is not um going to address every element so you're going to have to have some pros and cons or puts and takes or or that. Um, so before we start taking specific elements, the architects and engineers went to work to put together some packages that made sense um, within the project budget. So I would say taking time to consider that um, before we start going one by one. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hill. Um, Ms. Martin, do we have some comments? I'm sure we do. Just one? Sure. Okay. If anybody wants to speak 
uh, from the public on this item. Make sure you fill out a card, because um, I only have one. Ms. Tribble. Yeah, I um, looked at some of the options on there. Ms. Tribble, we're going to pull that down a little bit so we can hear you better. Okay. There you go. And I was looking, reviewing some of the options, and um, Mrs. Hill, I agree with you. We need to have more information on these options and look at um, uh, what some of the other needs are for this school, because we know that there's so many needs. And to really be able to fairly decide, we need uh, the architect and the contractor to be able to give us a more exact on how we can utilize the little money that we are getting for so many needs that are needed. And, um, and I see that Tilden Construction will be doing the construction. And I know that they are doing all the construction for all the high schools. And um, since North is the last school to be worked on, can we get some kind of discount <laughs> so we can get more done? I mean, seriously, you guys do it. You guys have worked on all the high schools. And we appreciate if you can give us a little discount. <laughs> Se senior, senior discount, AARP discount, retired government discount, you know, whatever you can give, we appreciate. Uh, because we need to be able to get as much as we can with what little funds we're going to get because North needs so much. So, you know, and I do have one other question about the electrical, because when I was there, the electrical in the wall, it was all black. We were scared to stay in there because it would go shh, shh, shh. And so, you know, I want to make sure that that's covered before, you know, or is that included in the, the amount that we have now? Because it's really bad. I mean, it looked like uh, some homeless house somewhere. So if we can do that, but I, I uh, asked Tilden Construction and the architects to just, you know, have mercy on North High School <laughs> because we're the last school to get any work done. You guys have done some wonderful work at the other schools. I've seen it. So just, you know, help us out. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Mr. Lee, if you don't mind, while I appreciate Mrs. Tribble's uh, efforts to make our dollars stretch further, <laughs> um, I do know that um, Assistant Superintendent Sam Martin and his team, they uh, watch the dollars pretty well to get, get value for the dollar, as you have seen at the other sites. Um, as to the needs of the site, we did have a full site assessment, as you know, which lists the, all the needs of the site. Um, I do want to uh, just remind us of the uh, limitations of the ESSER dollars. There's a page in here I won't look We'll look back for it now. Uh, the the uh, HVAC work with ESSER is con consistent in each of the options, and uh, they had a lot of particulars listed under there, um, but we have to also make sure that it fits within the guidelines of what can be spent for ESSER. So I just wanted to clarify that part. And uh, I agree with Mrs. Tribble again. Uh, in the value of looking, really delving into the options and see um, does it make the sort of project design package that you design. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Um, thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you to our architect and to our construction manager for being here to also answer any questions. Um, I will open it up now to the board. Mr. Lee, can I say, I just wanted to ask. If you turn on your mic, you oh, can. Sorry. Is is uh, our, is Principal Gonzalez here with us tonight? I think I see her over there. I, Mr. Leo, I've always felt that. And Kinnear actually was. Can't hear you. Got to. I'm sorry. Uh, I believe that it is important we entrust our principals with the campus. They know them up and down. I walked uh, the campus with Mr. Kinnear and, and uh, Principal Gonzalez. Uh, it's all right with you. She's your employee, but I'd like to hear her input. 
uh, when under Measure B, Mrs. Allaby and I remember that, and Kinnear was one of them, that they didn't have a lot of input. And uh, so who knows it better than them? So if we could hear from Ms. Gonzalez about some of the needs, not so much the plan, plans, but what are some of the more critical needs on the campus as she sees them? I'd appreciate it. All right, not to put uh, Principal Gonzalez on the spot, but would you care to maybe share a little bit of insight from your experiences on the campus and maybe some of the things that you've heard from some stakeholders that you've communicated with about these various options that are presented? Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. Thank you for, for inviting me up this evening. Um, in terms of input, I first want to thank all of you on the board for um, increasing the, the Measure O modernization budget for John W. North High School. We're very grateful for that. Um, oh, we're very grateful for the increase in our Measure O modernization funding. Um, it's a very difficult task because we can't do everything that the site needs um, and the work that Tilden Coyle and Go Architects put in for our options tonight. Um, give us a better variety, if you will. Um, and in terms of the needs for the school, um, our locker room is in, in need of modernization. So as far as the needs of the school, that's a high priority for that locker room modernization. Um, there is a concern about upgrading the science classrooms for the staff. Um, there is a recommendation from the design committee to build a new gymnasium because right now we have um, a gymnasium with no auxiliary gymnasium. So if we were able to have a new gym, the current existing standing gym would in turn be the auxiliary, if you will. Um, I know that one of the options is to build an auxiliary gym and then turn our multi-purpose room into the team rooms, the restrooms, the um, concession stands and such. But the MPR is currently our dance classroom and where our cheer and stunt practice, which could go to the auxiliary gym, but all of our parent meetings for our academies and all of our um, banquets we have for our sports teams and for any of our specialized program use that area. So we'd have to get a little creative on where we could have those events. Um, do you have any questions for me? Because I could keep going. So, how do, the, how do your students feel? I mean, we talk about beautification. Mm -hmm. I know you've gone to Poly and. Uh, that that's, we feel has really enhanced the student experience. What's the feeling today among uh, the Huskies uh, um, as to their campus? Restrooms has been a high priority for our students. I see Jordan nodding her head over there. Um, restrooms, uh, modernization and upgrade has been um, a priority for our student body. I, I, I don't see Coach Brown here, but I'm gonna see if you, I can test you. How many sports uh, programs, including PEP and et cetera. Do you know that North, I mean, for instance, when Arlington opened, when we first started talking about additional gyms, it had eight sports. North, along with Poly, Arlington, Ramona, were all built before Title IX. And now Arlington has 28 sports. So I just wonder what North's situation is. I don't have that number in my brain right now. That's okay. But it'd probably be very similar in the size of the campuses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and do you use the gymnasiums not just for sports and pep, and, but you use them, I assume, for testing and uh, other, I mean, you have. The multi-purpose room is used for testing. Um, the multi-purpose room is used for testing, but also for the gymnasium. Um, our band practices in the gym at time, our color guard practices in the gym in time, stunt team here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, and thank you again very impressed with the tour and particularly with the, uh, the science teachers who all seem to be around and, um, and they're great hydroponics programs they have there. Very proud of that. And a lot of good input from the folks, but uh, hey, go ahead with your, thank you. Thank you for allowing that, Mr. Lee. 
Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. No I'm sure you're going to stick around if there's more questions. I will be right Perfect. over there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else from the board have any questions or comments? Um, Dr. Farouk? Thank you. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, so uh, great work um, for staff uh, and our the, the team that's involved with it, with Till and Coyle and Geo Architects and uh, the design committee team that's volunteering from the community, the principal, everybody. I really appreciate everyone's efforts on this. Uh, I, I have two questions. One is, you know, this, this is under a report discussion, not action. What specifically, is this purely just informational? You're keeping us in the loop or what, is there some tangible direction you're seeking from the board at this time? Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, tonight, we're, we're bringing you a report as a response to the October 7th meeting with uh, additional information that the board requested. Uh, at this meeting, there's no action being taken. It's just to get your feedback so that we can take it back to the team. We can um, <clears throat> analyze it and, and provide you with uh, a greater uh, scope of work, a detailed scope of work for the next meeting. Thank you. My, my only feedback, um, besides just again my appreciation for everyone involved in this, uh, and I'm glad that we'll continue to move this along as, as quickly as possible, is that we try to be as inclusive uh, beyond just the normal process of having a design committee and you know so forth, that as, uh, as more of the community, the North community uh, at large, alumni, uh, community members, students, and so forth, the more input that we can get a, as a board, uh, the better. And uh, you know, getting more um, itemized information so that even if it doesn't fit some of these options in like a clean cut way, where we could you know sw swap different things out, I think um, the, because the, you know bonds only come around you know so often that uh, even if that requires a lot of detail and you know breakdown of information, I just think it'll serve all of us well that we feel like everybody had as much information to work with as possible. So th that's my, my only uh, feedback. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farouk, i got a question for you. What kind of detail, besides what was presented today, would you be looking for? So, so w what I mean is, like, uh, w with the different options that were shown, uh, let me see, it'll, sh it'll show, like, bullet, line, uh, bullet points. These are the different items, and then it'll have, like, a total amount. But if we had the dollar amounts per item, we'd have more customization possible or more configuration. Uh, again, I know that that requires more effort. But. I think there's, um, and I think our CMs here, Jason's here, and maybe Sergio can answer too. Um, I know I had some of those same questions during the build out of the agenda, and I think there's some efficiencies that are gained in terms of pricing uh, when they package them together. So, like, cause I asked that same thing, why can't we just have dollars and just kind of pick through the menu of what we want till we get to the 50 million mark and um, you can tell us why that's not so simple. Yeah, so uh, we kind of package things together and there's definitely some economy of scales when you kind of go with different packages because there's some similarities or efficiencies with them. Uh, but also at the very end you'll notice that uh, our best to communicate some itemized options if you were to kind of put them together yourself and pick from a priority list there of some of the previous parts and pieces from the, pre the first five options. So in the option six, you can kind of see in the buckets of new construction, modernization, infrastructure, or site, uh, what you might pick to see what would add up to 61.5 million. And uh, so we did our best to communicate that kind of uh, idea or option uh, for you. And so if you were to look at uh, one of them and want some more detail, uh, they're, they're described somewhat in a little bit more detail in the previous five options when you go to look at them based on the nomenclature. But the bottom line is by categorizing them in these options, mm -hmm. you're, you're getting these economies of scale and synergies uh, from an uh, oper uh, uh, operational standpoint. And that, that captures more savings than us just evaluating these things individually, right? Yes, and so, for example, if you if you came to us under this option six and said, if we were to package these items together, uh, design team, uh, I'm sorry, architect, engineer, construction manager, uh, is there any kind of efficiencies? What's the benefits, kind of pros and cons to this particular option six? By putting in all these together, we can come back and articulate some of our observations for if you were to want something different than maybe these other five approaches that we've put together already. The first five, op five options. 
That, that makes sense. Uh, thank you for explaining that. Uh, so my only feedback then is really that we go beyond the normal design committee involvements and just try to be as inclusive with uh, input and, um, it, and uh, an opportunity to educate and to create more awareness about what, what the projects are. So thank you all. Sure. Anybody else? Ms. Yes. Allity. Sorry, I thought I'd, I thought I'd mark my wanting to talk. Um, can you explain to me a little bit about um, the drawings where you add the new science wing? Because part my priority is the science classrooms. I'll, put, I'll say that up front, that that's a very much a priority for me, is to get either the science classrooms modernized to the point that they look new and act new, or to put new ones in there in the new building. When you have designed the building where you've placed it, is there a reason, or could that building be moved? Uh, so in working with the architect, uh, we looked at many different locations to place a building. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you a general concept in the answer. Yeah. Uh, the general concept is where can we place a building without trying to move interim housing and have costs associated with interim housing? Where can we build a new building, place that building without moving interim housing, then remove portables at the end, i.e., trying to get, maximize the dollars into the classroom building. Okay. Could the classroom building be located at a different location? Absolutely. Uh, there's pros and cons to it, but just know that we were trying to put most of the dollars okay, into the building. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted to know, whether or not this was a, a it, it could be plopped around for the same amount of money, and you're saying no, that you've looked at the cost and where you've positioned that would be the most cost effective. With, with the understanding around interim housing, because there's, there are, there's, really few spots to locate a building without kind of being on top of some other building, right? And so we studied it and the architect suggested that if we were to place a building, being sensitive with interim housing costs, these would most likely be the locations. Okay. Um, the next thing is, um, on option five, you've got a science building, but you don't mark science classroom modernization. And I just, you don't put a star there. So I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding what I was seeing with option five. Doesn't option five have a new science modernization building? If I can ask our communications team to bring up, bring back. Yes. Well, the picture if you put the picture of option five up, it looks to me like you've got a new science building, right? That's it. So, yeah, Ms. Halvey, uh, option five includes a couple of two-story classroom buildings, but they're, they are not science classrooms. These are standard classrooms oh. to remove all portables from campus. Oh, so this will be a replacement you. of portables. Okay, thank you. I was getting used because you put them in the same exact spot as the new science class. Yeah, again, we're trying to oh, okay. maximize the dollars with the location of a new building. Okay. So it applies to, uh, applies to both options. So in option five, it would just be remodeling the current science, building, science classrooms wherever they exist on campus. So option five, the only work that's uh, allocated under option five for the classroom buildings is the HVAC and lighting upgrades. There is no science Modern is okay. Correct. Okay, so that's why you didn't put a star. And beautification of campus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, also, some of the some of the options you have staging areas and some you don't. Is there some reason for that? I'm sorry. What was that? The staging, staging area? Staging areas. Again, trying to maximize looking ahead for during construction, trying to avoid uh, disruption of classes, trying to avoid interim housing, trying to see how we can manage the construction. So we're looking at the back parking, parking lot for a staging area during construction. I mean, that makes perfect sense. It's just some of them don't have that staging area. Well, depends on the scope of work. So you're saying there'd be so little work that they wouldn't even Correct. need a Correct. staging area. Okay. Correct. Well, um, uh, you know, it's really hard. I'm trying to do your little, your little thing at the end where I pick and choose. I'm, I'm, I clearly want new remodeled or and or science, science rooms. Um, I clearly would like to be able to accommodate um, some sort of gymnasium upgrade. Explain to me 
There's an awful lot of similarity in cost. There's only, th what, $3 million difference between a new gymnasium and an auxiliary gymnasium? H how is that possible? Because... Right, and I think if we go back to the slide too, um, the difference is the work associated with the function. So for an auxiliary gym, we're trying to... Of the plot plan that has the gym, that has where we keep a gym and have auxiliary right. gym. I think yeah. it might be option we two. Do. Option two, please. Oops, I'm going back. By 12. Trying to get the difference between the two since they, the prices were. By 12. There you go. Nope. So, That's 11. By 12. And I think in order to answer this question, we'll go back to option one. For a brand new gymnasium, this option doesn't touch any existing building. So we're not touching the existing gymnasium. It's all new construction. And we're providing all the uh, support functions within this new building. Yeah, so I know, that's why I'm going back to yeah, option back, one. She's going to, back to option one. Where you, so I she can, guess, yeah. Uh, oh, I, I, guess, I guess I'm looking at option six, itemized scope. Right, yeah. so again, option one. Go back one more to page 10, where the picture is bigger. Uh, there you go. Okay. So the, the pink box, that's a brand new building. That's what the uh, cost estimate includes. The brand new building with all the support amenities included what, in there. What are support amenities? Including a team room, restrooms, concession stands, check-in kiosk, ticket booth, uh, all the functions that they're lacking right now. So this new building will include all those areas. So the square footage is obviously larger than a regular gymnasium. It includes all of those options. With option two, in order to be able to uh, provide the site with the functions they need for the hang gymnasium. On, on, so let's stop on this one. Sorry. Okay. I'm, no, no, that's good. I'm trying to be intentional <laughs> this time around. So on the option one, Mrs. Alavi, where you saw that little extra site piece with all of the, the ticket booth and all of that, all of the functions of a new gym would be incorporated there. Correct. But other work on the existing gym. There would be no work on the existing gym. It would stay okay. the same. Then Let, option let's go two. To, let's go to our um, itemized scope for a minute. Let's just take a new competition gymnasium and a new auxiliary gymnasium and tell me, without putting them in the options for now, they're pretty close in price. Correct. So. Your option N2, which is the auxiliary gymnasium, includes the modernization of the existing gymnasium and the reconfiguration of the multipurpose into all those additional support areas that the school needs. The restrooms, the team rooms. The, so that area requires a complete modernization, heavy level modernization. So that cost right there includes both of those scopes. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm not making myself clear. Um, auxiliary gyms in our other projects have been um, basic gym spaces with bathrooms included, with maybe some storage and. Can I say something? Just, and I just want to know. I, I think she needs to clarify for us. I agree with you, Mrs. Dalaby. The competition gym, which I support, is not tearing down the old gym. Is that correct? It is tearing down the old gym. It's not tearing down. So even though, so the difference that she has here from the 12 to the 15 million, Anna, means that the 12 million is more like Mrs. Alibi's alluding to, uh, the type that's being built at Poly and the type that was built at Arlington. What, when she says the 15 million competition gym, it's a auxiliary gym, but it's on steroids and it becomes the main court for the Huskies. Is All right. that what you're saying, ma'am? Okay. Correct. So none of these have tearing down the existing gym and building a uh, Martin Luther King High School behemoth. Well, are, are you sure? Mrs. Alavi, if I may, um, on, the, on the line N1 that you're looking at, that's just building a new competition gym, 900 feet, right. with all the amenities. On the second line, there's two projects. 
a smaller new auxiliary gym with 300, 350 seats, plus modernizing the existing gym. The top one doesn't include modernizing the existing gym. Okay. Please thank keep you. the presentation up so we so can. So it's one purpose. project versus two projects. I guess I was trying to see whether or not we could do some kind of gym or model, some kind of science enhancement, do the locker, do the bathroom, and do some beautification. So I, that's where I'm going. I know none of your none of your options exactly fit that. <laughs> so I was looking down the item I scope to see if we could closely closely align that. Um, all I can think of that we might want to do as a board is maybe suggest priorities and maybe see where those priorities fall for the team and see how closely one of these options aligns. I don't know how else to do this. Well, I think if we, sh I think that's the best way to do it. I mean, I think, I think it would be helpful if each board member shares the option they prefer and then if there's modifications on those options, um, and then hopefully staff can keep track of that. And then um, we can see if that sticks within the budget or not. Is that possible? All right, so it sounds like Mrs. Alvey, well, you guys got what Mrs. Alvey's priorities were. Can, I, would, uh, I would choose option number four as my first choice. It doesn't have a gym option, so I was trying to see what I could do. Okay. So option four, but add a gym. Mm -hmm. And then your priorities are science classrooms, either new or like new, mm -hmm. gym upgrade, lockers, bathroom, beautification. That's what I wrote when you. That's okay. correct. Is there an order of, I don't know if that helps. Is there an order of? Well, science, my, the academic uh, classrooms and science spaces is my first choice. Beautification is my second choice. Uh, locker rooms and then gymnasium space. Okay. Uh, to help the board, if we can pull up the presentation again. Let's just keep the presentation up there. Yes. We don't need to look at us. Uh, the, selection, the selection of the menu uh, needs to stay within the $26 million, as you can see here. That, that gives you a, a framework of which areas select from staying within the $26 million. The other thing I was going to tell um, Mrs. Alvey and maybe the rest of the board, um, because I know it has an asterisk there on option number six, that it does not include costs for architects and engineering and fees and all the other, we call them soft costs, right? Um, so those, I don't think any of those on option six include those non-construction costs, which are significant, correct? Uh, we're showing those, those soft costs here on this section. Oh, okay. Which is the, which is itemized also, but with a total. So any, any items or any scope of work that you choose from the above, uh, three, three groups, um, it will ha you'll have a separate um, uh, soft cost contingency separate. Yeah, so we can't add it up to 50 million. We can add it up to 27. Yeah, million, where you yeah, see the 26. total there, total yeah. itemized scope would be, yeah, 26 something. Yeah. Because right. they just did, they did the soft cost and other costs right. on the total amount, 50 million. Okay. Is there anything else, Mrs. No, Alvey? That, that gives you my kind of hold. All right. Thank you. Staff is clear on Mrs. Alvey's priorities. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next, Mr. Hunt. Thank you. Uh, I do want to remind, just before it gets too far away, that Principal Gonzalez asked us not to touch her multi-purpose room. She uses it for a lot of things. Uh, again, my tour of North was enlightening. Um, it's always been interesting to me when we first started that North and Riverside Poly were designed, constructed, and opened at the same time, yet they had some startling differences uh, highlighted by the chiller at Poly versus package units at North. So I, my walk around and under measure B, uh, North, I mean, uh, yeah, North and Arlington received a one-story classroom building where Poly received a two. So perhaps all high schools aren't created equally and there is things that need to be done. And Mrs. Tribble is all the money that's left but I do support you in advocating for my friends at Tilden Coyle that you, you see what you can get for our senior discount. And uh, you don't want her on your email list, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, but I've been working back and forth with Mr. Kinnear and, uh, and, and what we saw, and uh, including, I should just preface, 
The, the campus itself, if you remember, Mrs. Allaby, when we were looking at the track and removing that, they're still turning the sprinklers on like you did when you were a kid. Well, the campus itself, they're still doing that. That's a waste of valuable staff time. That's a waste of conservation. We, we should have the low uh, flow heads. E everything we should be doing, and Mr. San Martin and I've talked about this, should take in cons energy conservation in every way. Um, Mr. Kinnear and I agree on, on, and I'm just doing it not so much in, in priority that a science room is more important than this or like that. I, and I'll leave that because it, it's going to end up with, with money we have. But Mr. Kinnear and I both uh, support, and I'm, I'm just going to start with the entrance off of Linden, and then I'll start a walk in, in if we, you will, with me. That we uh, enhance the main entrance off of Linden, we enhance the, uh, the fence that's there, the chain link fence or whatever, that can give a, uh, a much more bright and welcoming and proud, husky proud uh, 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 image for there. And then how many modulars, is it three or eight that are right along the line? It's, so now I'm in the parking lot, all right? I'm looking to my, school's in front, I'm looking to my left, there's, is that, is that six or eight? Um, from the Linden side, I think it's over 20, Portables? No, I'm sorry, in the first row, I apologize. The ones that face the parking lot. So the, the, by the 700 building? Uh, there's I, nine, 19 portables. 19, okay, but there's six or eight that actually back up to the fence, the back of them face the parking lot, right. right? So again, this has to do, Mr. Kinnear and I both felt, and Ms. Gonzalez, that if we can take the first ones or so and screen them, you know, Doctors bury their mistakes, architects put ivy on them. So you screen those so it doesn't have that, you know, modular look. And, and then to take as many as possible under the budget and make them into a modern two-story classroom. Whether that becomes a science classroom, a building, or math, or whether uh, you, uh, and, and you move those, those science rooms in the, into the new one and renovate those existing ones into regular classrooms, um, you're gonna have a, madam, you're gonna have a lot more input on that because what it costs per square foot and all of that. But to have a classroom. Then, um, hang on, let me read down. Give it to Mr. Kinnear, he was going back and forth on his cruise with me on this. So next is you come up, okay, you're at the front now, the campus is in front of you, you're about to walk onto the campus. And to do there a a bright and uh, attractive and secure, very much like Ramona High School, which you walk in there front, where you've had the, the wrought iron uh, and the arch above that has the logos and the name and all of that. A presentation of some sort that gives young people going to that school some pride as they walk on the campus and impresses the ones that came to play them or debate against them or whatever may be, or visit, uh, because we want young people to look at school choice uh, and that's good so and, and if this would have uh, and principal Gonzalez talked about this unfortunately at Ramona we weren't able to do it but there's a guard sits out there and we that's our rules no, nobody on campus but it, he or she is under a, a an easy up right so to have a secure booth that they can be in that is wired with all the things they need of course to prevent uh, you know print the badges and check IDs and all of that against the system, but that that would be a, a really nice feature. Now, we go on to the gym, and I will say auxiliary gym, but the existing gyms at both Poly and uh, North, uh, one, they're built before Title IX, and we all know what the problems are there, but the existing gyms are both have, and Dr. Ryan Lewis can help me here, but they don't have CIF competition uh, proper ceilings. They're 21 feet, and it's supposed to be 25, I believe, to go all the what you want. So in volleyball and other things, it's, it bounces off. So what Mr. Kinnear and I have talked about is that the auxiliary gym to be built but actually be built has this competition gym to have as much of these, you know, in, just like Poly North don't have now, internal access to restrooms, ticket booth type thing, a, uh, and the other ones that you've mentioned, of course, snack bar and all of that. 
if possible, that, and I don't know as much about the locker rooms, but if, there, if, if for basketball, uh, volleyball, wrestling, et cetera, uh, if those can be connected, that's great. And as was done, and Mrs. Allaby's idea was done at Poly, that the area in between then would be developed. It's a nice gathering place, you know, and when you come out and just um, it'd be attractive. But also, there isn't enough seating. And, and Mr. Kinnear and I talked, he was wondering if we, I mean, that's a very, the, the seating for lunch that nowhere accommodates. You know, of course, North and Poly opened for 1,600 children or students. There's 2,600 there this morning at each. So the seating and all of it's always going to be a problem. But perhaps this area with shade and all can be used to enhance some of that lunchroom seating and, and then maybe that can be moved for games or whatever, but, but to have that in there. Uh, but the auxiliary gym would actually become a competition gym. And then to the extent possible, the existing gym we recommend, to the extent possible, upgraded, enhanced, certainly LED lighting, which doesn't cause shadows, which when you're playing basketball is a, an unfair advantage. Uh, whatever we can do without really triggering our wonderful ADA. Uh, let me go to my next one. Um, okay, so that. I remember Mr. Kinnear, and I don't quite know as much about it, but there was some ideas about enhancing the library, uh, and there was some special education. Ms. Gonzalez, is that correct? Up, up above, is that? Okay, so four classrooms are for special ed that are uh, very outdated, not as presentable as they might want them to be. Um, the theater, which has ADA access to the stage, thankfully, uh, from the outside, but it does need new sound and lighting. It's, it's like the situation we have in Ramona where probably some dad tried to come in there at one time and shorted the thing out. Um, and, uh, and there's other great things. If, again, it's about where young people can gather and recreate together and maybe put their phones away and all that. And we did that at Poly with a lot of the shade, uh, the, what's it called, Kathy, the Poly, what's, what's it called? Pollywood, well, Pollywood, which is everybody's crazy about, but you have that grass area. I don't know if that grass area get, in front gets completely taken out by the gym, but we're anywhere we can create, uh, because COVID's gonna be with us for the rest of our life and maybe there'll be other things. So having, and, and it should just be areas that I can meet my fellow student and et cetera that are outside. I mean, we live in Southern California and that, that uh, give me uh, and, and my fellow students a, uh, a sense of, of place and belonging. Uh, and then finally, from Mr. Kinnear and I, uh, the front of the, what's the street north faces? I just went blind on it. What is it? Yeah, Spruce. Right? There, okay, sorry. Thank you. So, um, just look at it, to improve the curb appeal there, uh, even the, the facade above is just old gray. I mean, there's some wonderful artistic things we can do up there with Mr. North himself. We can do it with, um, I'm working with the ESPN artists, and maybe we can get them to do it. Some of the great people that, and there's many in all of our schools, but have, that have attended North and advanced north and so on and so forth. Perhaps some new signage on the walls, some upper lighting, super graphics, et cetera. And perhaps, Mr. San Martin, we move, remove some of those old big pine trees that completely block the campus and, and if we're gonna spend this kind of money. So that is essentially uh, uh, what Mr. Kinnear and I, uh, he, he uh, confirmed with me today. And just to add what he wrote back, uh, um, my top, wait a minute, excuse me just a minute, I'm, my top, my top two of priorities are a classroom science building and gym on the student parking lot south side with ornamental fencing and landscaping to make a grand entrance. When I get back, I'd appreciate talking to you about, you know, um, and also one of the things, yeah, and any calls, no. Uh, one of the, the comments made too, we want to be sure whatever science, however we do the science buildings, is that we have a sequestered or secure area because we noticed in there that there's different chemicals 
that are used in science classes and they're just sort of on shelves and that's not the best thing for us to do in the world and that's not great for the teachers. So just a place that is secure and uh, I understand none of them are flammable and uh, locked and so it, and it doesn't take up as much classroom space. And uh, did I mention hydroponics? I did, didn't I? And uh, Kathy and I have argued about that or debated about that. We, we never argue, we differ. And uh, it, it is, it is simply wonderful and they've created these things out of uh, you know it's just it's really what they've done I was so impressed but those are the ones if you wrote those down someone uh, that Mr. Kinnear and I thought uh, within the budget I mean we and I'm thank you Mr. San Martin I did ask you in our review that you separate out so we all understand that the 1.5 million money for the HVAC and S are 11.5 oh I'm sorry let's I wasn't a math major. I got to move that decimal, don't I? Um, the 11.5, whether or not, and thankfully, whether or not we had Measure O or not, they need, they're getting that from the ESSER funds. That is a health and safety environmental thing. So that's aside. But there, in the 50 million, and I'd love to have you put it on there and to define it, the 50 million is Measure O money. So we all understand that. The citizens understand it. And, uh, and it is justified a after going there and, and seeing that. And I do want to thank the citizens and volunteers who gave an extraordinary amount of time uh, to our staff and uh, our, our, our consultants, et cetera, uh, in, in these suggestions. They live it. They support it. And I do like the way you phased some of this, and hopefully you can do that, that same. But. And I'd love to have a building that can take all 19 months out. But, Mr. Hunt, was there yeah. an option that you preferred? With no, the I, there really isn't. There isn't an option I prefer. It's Dale and I were both picking and choosing to create a different one. So we're not, we're not sequestered Can uh, someone summarize the... Well, I have a couple questions okay. for Mr. Hunt before we summarize. Mr. Hunt, you um, could... Um, Assistant Superintendent San Martin, could you go to option five, the big picture, please? Page eight, slide 18. So on the bottom there, Mr. Hunt, is where the portables are. And you said uh, the six to eight portables that face the fence there. Is it, that's these kind of light red? Yes. Yes, ma'am. That's the light red. And so, so there is one. Two. Were you saying to uh, to replace those portables or to put um, I was screening? Saying, I was saying to take out six to eight of them towards, if that is if that is uh, east, uh, mm -hmm. then the, the higher, the ones that are close to the campus and however best a, a design lays out, so I'm, uh -huh. I'm not doing this, um, that could create a six to eight classroom, two-story building. The ones that face out to the parking lot that, that have a, they're a terrible looking billboard for, you know, shield them somehow. They're either paints or let's put super graphics on them or whatever we can do that presents the uh, uh, superintendent that presents the, the campus when you pull up to that parking lot that has some pride. Okay. okay. So remove six to eight of those portables, replace with the building, and the remainder put screening. Yes, ma'am. And, okay. and that can be either Mr. Kinnear and I felt, Ms. Gonzalez consulted. I mean, uh, we know that in, in the existing science rooms, we have to be careful what we do because it could trigger yeah. ADA for, mm -hmm. from here to, you know. Uh, but what can be done there? But these could also be, and it's, it's up to the academics, it's up to how y'all plan and, and cost and everything. That new building could be the science half wing, uh, and the others are converted. Perhaps it's simpler, cheaper to take those and just convert them to regular classrooms, et cetera. Uh, but whatever way works best. It would, with science and what we're pushing these days in STEM, if, if options can be done, I, I think I would love to see that. Uh, I think, you would agree, Ms. Allaby, that, that make it a modern, give a, a, a setting that is very modern when it comes to STEM that, that we can have. Because it's only going to grow. And technology and engineering and those sort of things, we want to have that where, where we can. So. And two, two more points of clarification, yes, Mr. Hunt, if you don't mind. Would yes, you mind reiterating Mr. Kinnear's top priorities? And then if you have top priorities, what they would be? No, like, believe it or not, Mr. Kinnear and I, and I are on the same drumbeat. What? And, uh, <laughs> on most things. On most things. No, I was I was glad that Dale invited me after that night, and he was surprised I showed up. So, 
My top two priorities, says Mr. Kinnear, are yes. a classroom science building. Classroom science. And a gym on the student parking lot south side with ornamental fencing and landscaping to make the grand entrance. Um, he and I, when we talked about Jim, though, and, and that's why, was, if you'll know, Ms. Gonzalez talked about it. The, and, and we went through this at Arlington, and Mrs. Allaby made the observation that a gymnasium is also a classroom. It's the only classroom you can't replace if one goes down. So having two of these entities where the band can be practicing as loud and as blaring as they want to be, and girls basketball is over here in the other one. And, and that we can do that and we can have, right now you, you have to have uh, the JV, uh, even in a big gym, the JV has to, uh, uh, the varsity has to wait for the JV and where those games could be going at the same time or, or whatever's needed. And, and of course you have sports, Mr. Lewis, you have wrestling and basketball. When is, when is volleyball played? Wait, is it? Okay. Well, I, I, so I, I'm just saying, so we have multiple choices. It would be great to have an edifice, a poly pavilion, and, you know, what, what uh, CBU has with their beautiful, beautiful city, city facility, and they use that too for their chapel. But uh, having these two gives a campus manager, a principal, the athletic director, band options. So they're not trying to book one against the other and uh, can use it. So. Uh, whatever is the gymnasium that we want it to be the gymnasium where the Huskies are playing their games uh, is, is that. And the other one can be practice. It can be when the Huskies are playing their games or practicing, the band can be there and all that. And I think wrestling uses, I don't know for sure, but uh, wrestling uses, no, you have a, you all ought to see the poor condition, but great team, of what North has for a wrestling practice room. It is, it is, I, uh, it's, what's, uh, Kistler, Kistler's son is the coach, just like his aunt and his dad, phenomenal. But it's just, there's not a place, where they go in there, the girls can't change in the same place and all that, so it's just some of these things, and wrestling as we know, because we approved that building at King at, uh, at that time, is one of the sports that uh, the East Coast schools, because on the West Coast, only Cal Baptist and Stanford has wrestling though. But East Coast wrestling's a huge sport, and so they're recruiting uh, young ladies from the Inland Empire area. Santiago has an amazing girls wrestling program. So you want to be able to look at that as well, if, if money's there to Mr. give them. Uh, I Mr. Hunt, just, to, just so we make sure everyone gets a chance to speak too, and we get some clarity. So was there a preference over, I know you said gymnasium and science classroom. But those two, I mean, I'm not a math major either, but that's more than the budget already. Well, and then we've got to get Tilton Cole to cut the price. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm just saying, okay, I'm throwing those out. We put them together, and there's everything we want. As you said, Renee, Beck, you can't do everything. Right. But, but uh, both Dales and my priorities are enhancement of the experiments when you walk onto the campus, security, and then... Uh, Addressing science, technology, engineering, math, in, a, in some of the modulars, uh, becoming a building, and then the auxiliary gym, but it be, but is built to be a competition gym, uh, right. and and the landscaping and all of that. Uh, they don't have the ADA issues. I was glad to see that, uh, but if we can cobble some of that together, that was our thoughts. Okay, may I ask a question about the modulars? Please. The modulars, when you were talking, uh, Mr. Hunt, in that corner about removing some or putting a building, can you help me understand the intent of what you were trying to to do there with the with the modulars? Whether it was to put a, how many to remove was the goal, or the hide to rest, or I'm trying to understand whether well, we, we pull eight is, or. Well, this has probably changed, Mr. Sam Martin, since you and I talked about it three three years ago. But essentially, we were talking about removing a modular. And putting, which I think we get half a million for from this, not half, maybe fifty thousand dollars from the state to get rid of a module. But each classroom, if, if you had, we were saying is a six classroom. I think it was six or eight we have over at Liberty. Each one of them costs about a million dollars. So, and of course we know that 
prices in construction worldwide are on an unprecedented incline, mm -hmm. not about to go away anytime soon with all the markets. But so I would say as many as we can. On the other side, and with respect to everybody, as Mrs. Allaby observed when we were talking about the same thing at, uh, over at Arlington, the modulars are a concern because in the elementary grades, a student is in that modular all day. In the high school grades, respectfully to the young people, they're in there for one classroom. So when push comes to shove, I do want a new building there. I think they deserve it, they deserve modern feeling and operating and mechanical, uh, but uh, I'd love to replace all of them. But that would be, the building would be in part, uh, you have those three rows, the row over here and, and maybe the second one, is to place a building so when you come onto that campus, first of all, it's closer to the rest of the campus, but it, uh, when you come onto the campus, it would be attractive. These back here towards Linden aren't that great, plus they're deeper in. So. There's lots of ways to screen things now with mesh art and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Thank you. I, th I think I better understand. Depending on the priority of where we go, at a minimum, if there is something to be done to screen them, but ideally, if we can remove as many as we can to do a two-classroom building, depending on budget, to, to bring that up and then not, not have as many modules. Somebody understands me. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lee. May I just say? <laughs> Portable, remove all portables plus science classrooms does not go together. No, no. It isn't remove all the portables because if there's 19 portables, you're looking at 20 million plus and whatever the, we know that construction prices have gone up about 38%. So um, it's enhance the area in between the portables, make it nice and all. It's not bad. Screen those, some of the portables from the parking lot, make something attractive there. And the other ones that to the extent possible without, without digressing what else we can do, particularly with the gym and the enhancements, um, that we would uh, build a, a building with them. Remove is what we can within our price range. And, and what's efficient? I mean, it may be a, a six classroom building, you know, versus an eight isn't that much of a difference by the time you throw up the sticks and stones. And so whatever comes out best and the fluency and all that, is, and so as many as we can within the budget. All right, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you. Um, I know, Jordan, you didn't ring your microphone, but um, thank you. you're walking that campus every day. So I don't know if there's any insight you want to share with us. And maybe some you've talked to some of your colleagues and fellow students at school that have some, some priorities of their own. I would say the biggest priorities that I see whenever I go into North is the portables. They've outlived their um, usage, usage of time because like when you go in there it's like you look up and you're like why is there why is there car air fresheners up there and they told me like it's so the room doesn't get musty and you walk by and you're like why does it smell like skunk and it's because they have nests in there I think those are the biggest priorities whether it be in the 200s or the 300s or even in some of the 800s it's it's like very you could tell that they're very old and um, they need to be updated. And I could say that um, also the science wing, um, creating a new, entire new building for the science wing, I think that's a great idea. After I've heard like the entire science department talk about how um, outdated their facilities are, I think those are the two main priorities. And um, I know that um, you can't um, redo all of the portables, but I think it's like, a very important thing to look into as like those are the thing those are the classrooms that thousands of students go into every day and um, yeah I think those are the most important things on the list there sure. Sam Martin I know the portables I'm gonna just describe are over to our professional learning at the old grant those are amazing what what would the state allow if you wanted to get rid of, I was there, by the way, there, there was a stop in Scott, and they were trying to get our guy out and all, but uh, we're going to take out a portable, an old ancient portable, and uh, are we going to bring in a new one? Is there any, is there any uh, does the state consider anything? I know that those things are hard to get rid of and all that, but I'm just saying if we could get him, she's right, Jordan's right, better portables if, if we can't afford more of a building, but can you 
what would it take to have old portable be replaced by new portable? In terms of the state funding, for specifically for North High School, most of their, their modernization eligibility and new construction has been, has been depleted from prior projects. So anything we do with the portables will come will need to come out out of the measure of funds. Okay. So and I think to define what you're saying, I'm sorry, is that in the each school gets a bucket of money to, for matching, and then North over the years has used a lot of theirs. Yes. It's after 25 years, I believe, that you get your bucket. Yes. Uh, so, every uh, as uh, an existing building reaches or uh, over 25 years of age, uh, they're mm -hmm. eligible for modernization funds. Is there any now? This the new construction. Thank you. The new construction we're talking about, does, do we get, if the state bond goes through and when it does, is there matching funds for the new construction? Or, or does that have to do with the bucket? In the case of uh, North High School, the district, when they installed these 20 plus portables, they've used that eligibility. So they, they uh, the, the option of replacing them with new construction, they purchased the portables as part of that eligibility. But this time, anything we do would have to come out of Measure O. Uh, so there's very little state funding. I think it's under $4 million that North High School has eligibility for. Let's not forget it. But so you're, what about a brand new, you, is grass right now, uh, uh, gymnasium? Is there any help there? Or does that come out of the same? We are exploring all, all um, state fundings and grants. But at this point, uh, it's North High School is eligible for under $4 million from state funding. Okay, th thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. That's a very insightful answer, and we need to keep an eye on that. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, I think my, uh, is there anybody else have anything before I say something? I can go after you. Okay, yeah, just quickly. Um, yeah, I think based upon um, what, I've, what I've heard from our principal and from our architect and CM and then the board, you know, obviously these are all priorities. Uh, and it would be nice to take care of this this whole list um, and we're going to be able to take a, a pretty big bite out of this apple but we can't we can't eat that whole apple quite yet um, and I know that time is of the of the essence and we don't want to rush of course because um, as Dr. Farouk mentioned these bonds only come around so often so we want to make sure we make a good decision but uh, also as Mr. Hunt alluded to uh, we know that escalation is a serious constraint. So the, the longer that we make a decision on what we want to do, the, the scope of work shrinks. So uh, I, I hope that we can figure out what we can do in a relatively short amount of time while making sure we get the input necessary from, from those stakeholders. Um, I mean, I, I hear the the argument for the gym, and I think a gym at North High School would be a, be a great addition. Um, but I also hear some of the concerns from the teachers and some of the uh, some of the individuals that have spoke before about the condition of some of the classrooms. Um, and I mean, as important as you know, school plus two is in our athletics program and some of these extra programs that support our academic programs are. Uh, you know, I, I think prior for me, the priority should be in the classrooms. Um, uh, bef before before we do the gym, just because the classrooms need it so so badly, um, and we heard also from uh, several folks about the kind of the consistency of restroom modernization uh, and campus beautification. Uh, I think those are are our top priorities of mine as well. Um, I mean, the campus beautification budget isn't small. I think I quickly added it up, and it's around six million dollars, um, but. It touches pretty much the entire campus, from from painting to landscaping to hardscape, uh, and we've seen, uh, I think, the immediate feedback at Poly High School when we prioritized a lot of the funds that that school received on the kind of that main quad area, and what a difference that's made um, because of how many students uh, and community members use it. So I think that that campus beautification uh, needs to be a priority, uh, and uh, you know, if, if you do something with the classrooms. Um, you know, prioritizing price science is an important one, um, and that gets rid of some of those portables. So, I mean, I think if I was going to pick an option, um, I think four is most closely aligned with with uh, what I think should be a priority. I mean, I'd really like to do something 
uh, with the gyms because I don't think that touches any of the locker room mod modernization or anything like that, right? Which I know is a big problem. Uh, and I think, I don't know if, if, if there's somehow the, I think that science, uh, I don't know. And I, I guess that would be my other one too. Somehow modernizing the existing uh, locker rooms and bathrooms there so they can be functioned in an in a, in a efficient way. So those would be those would be mine. And you take it from the top, Mr. Lee. Number one would be what? Did you guys get it? Number four is my my number preference. four option four. Yeah. yeah, and then if there's the possibility to, um, you know, either trim down some of those options to to make enough funds to make some modernization to the existing gym, since I I don't know that there'll be enough money to build another one if we build the science classrooms. But all these things need to be done. So really, at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not uh, opposed to any of these options because I think they're all important. And, and, and I hope the next time our community supports a bond, we can take care of the rest of them. But I hope we can hear from, um, I, I mean, I was expecting we would get a lot of public input on this. And maybe because it's a, a report item and not a decision item, we have less members. Uh, but I, I hope that we can get the word out, uh, Principal Gonzalez, to the those that you know that have been, um, that this is important to them on what, so we can either get emails from them or get some feedback from them because, again, I, I want to make sure that the money that we have allocated can go as far as it can go, uh, so I don't want this process to go for months and months. Um, and I know there was a slide about time frame, um, which maybe we should go over before we leave tonight. This item. And Mr. Lee, Mr. Castro notified the people who were on the design team, which was 50 people. <laughs> like yeah. that, it was a lot of people. So they did get a notification. Yeah, and maybe they felt they, they've already shared kind of their priorities, which is, you know, we, we definitely heard them. Yeah. Um, Dr. Farouk? Thank you, President Lee. Uh, so I have a few questions. What, one, what was the design committee's recommendation again? Which option? Option number one. Okay. okay. So um, a couple of quick questions. One is, um, Trustee Hunt, uh, you and Trustee Kinnear, did you guys price out the the things that you you were mentioning? No, we were just shopping. We went and shopped. Okay. So, we didn't I, have all this information yet. Was, this was on December 17th. Okay. Because I I mean, just as all, everyone mentioned, I mean, obviously, ideally, you know, all of it needs to get done. So I think I I think for the purposes of a constructive discussion, we need to be we need to frame it around an option that that's actually you know that we can do i think that's really important and so to me you know big pictures wise i think the gymnasium and the classrooms are the most critical things but here's the the the, the question i have because on slide 21 the box where it says project soft cost and contingency it's about 24 million dollars right is, is my interpretation of that is that that's basically built into every, that's the whole situation, right? So I, I hope that all of us are thinking, factoring that in, that we're, if you're looking at these um, itemized lists, which don't take into account the synergies that we talked about before, but that it's not 50 million, it's, it's really uh, 26 million, because products have to soft cost and contingency are obviously in all products. It's not specific to North. That's just how it is. And so we really, it, it's, a, it, it's even more limited to work with than, than what it might appear on the surface if you just break this down. I'm sorry, what? what? Yeah, yeah, 50 million altogether, obviously, yeah. So, um, so I think it gives us very, you know, it, it makes it much more difficult, I think, to reconcile some of these things. So my, um, one, I wanted to confirm that, that I, I was understanding this correctly. Uh, the only thing I can think of that can maybe be more specific than option one, uh, because I do think the gymnasium is, is, is really um, very important, just because of the fact that it, the current state of condition it's in is just, it's just really um, completely anachronistic. Uh, it's not CIF yeah, it's not CIF. There's no way that that can continue. So, but with the science, with the cl classrooms, the science classrooms, 
when you guys have this itemized and you're describing it, is this a full, where you're touching everything kind of scenario? Like explain to me when you're saying modernizing science classrooms, how do you define that for the purposes of this project scope? Option that you're speaking of, Dr. Farouk? Right. When you say I'm, I'm talking about the specific item, science classrooms modernization. Oh, when they're on the itemized. On their modernization. Yeah, what does that include? We have looked at every single science classroom on campus and we have included all the needs that have been identified. So, so, it's, so it's fully addressing all of the needs of, of the science For the science classrooms, correct. So, because I think, you know, given that option one and two are the only ones that have the gym, and to me the classrooms are really important, uh, I, uh, what I'm wondering is if there's a combination of taking, a, you know, from the beautification, uh, towards the, the classrooms and being more surgical about the classrooms as opposed to just doing the, everything about them um, or, or some combination thereof. Th that's where I'm curious to see where we can try to have some middle ground within those first couple options because to me the classrooms is, you know, we got we to gotta find a way to do that. And so um, n now knowing that you're, you're saying that it would be the totality of everything that the, those ne classrooms needed, maybe there's something more to work with there. Uh, because I, I, when we did the, the tour, uh, you, Mr. San Martin, you had mentioned about some like and like replacement uh, of, of areas that that could generate some strategic savings, right, for the classrooms. This obviously is, is much more ambitious than what we had, that we had discussed. And, and again, obviously in an ideal world, we want to do everything, but I think the only thing that comes to my mind, analyzing all this just anecdotally, and again, I can't stress enough, the more community input we have overall, the better off all of us will be because we're not here to make these decisions in a vacuum, is thinking back to that conversation, the like-to-like -like replacement conversation in contrast to the way this is being proposed. Yeah, yeah you're right. So if, and I don't know what you need like if we need to walk that again to like drill down further, but I'd love to get some feedback. Obviously, we're not voting on any a decision right now, but I'd love to get some feedback um, on some middle ground there that can make those that can reconcile that. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Mr. Hunt. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President Lee. Yeah, very, Dr. Farouk, Trustee Farouk. Thank you. That was very. Apt. And uh, I don't want to be sequestered, and I won't be sequestered by the different options. I, that's what the board is here to do. So if we're mixing and matching, but I'm not condemning anyone. Um, the uh, content, it, it's going, Dr. Farouk and I did walk the science rooms. And Mr. Sam Martin, being conservative as he should be, he's saying this will cost you this, and this could be an ADA thing and all that. Whereas Mr. Mueller said, well, you know, under uh, uh, remove and replace. We, like for like. Yeah, yeah we, we can do new countertops. They don't have the holes in them because they don't have gas now and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of facade things we could do. That front counter looked ridiculous with it with the teacher teaches behind. It goes back to, you know, the original. So if, if there's cost savings there, then I, I think that's good. Uh, I don't think that's good. I know it's good. But let's look back at what we did with Arlington and Polly, some of our, now Polly, we didn't get to touch the classroom because the interior and the exterior were the, were the focus and the interior particularly is ADA. But what we did do at Polly, and we are, and we've done it Arlington, is we gave a presentation outside when you drive by and that, that new presentation from the, from the uh, central parking lot, which eventually under a future bond will even become more changed. You know, we've talked about that it was important. The presentation, I was going to go tomorrow, but but I'm going to put it off. But presentation at Arlington, I've been there, looks great. So, uh, you know, that's why Mr. Kinnear and I agree that we've got to not forget about the presentation. Kent Dacus, as you know, all of you know him. Kent's been the VP at California Baptist University over everything that's student related. Uh, he once told me, teachers don't quite feel this way, but he once told me, when students come to look at a campus, they want to know where they're going to eat, meet, and recreate. It has nothing to do with the classrooms, but it is about making the student feel that this is a, a school he, want, he or she wants to be at, 
They're proud of it. There's super graphics. It talks about history. It does these other things. Uh, I, don't ask me how, Kathy, but I was at SC just not too long ago. And just that whole garden area in between, the way it looks, and you, UCLA has the, the steps. And, all, it, and when I first went to RCC, I was you know, blown away. And it's important for that. And as Brent, you, Mr. Lee, you were saying, it's the two, the two plus two, ha having a young person be involved in something. And that's why I do advocate for the other gym, because it gives us more large space. And, and again, the gym goes down. There's nowhere else you can take. Gym goes down as a classroom, and classroom is sports as well. There's nothing else you can do, so they're they're out. So I think there is one. If we do do the gym there, we have to find a place for the asphalt courts. Is that right? Yeah. So, but uh, and and how have we done on the contingency since Tilden Coil is doing both Poly and Arlington? How have we done on our contingency on those two projects? When you refer to uh, contingency in regards to how the projects are going with the allowances, mm -hmm. uh, they're going as planned for the recommended con contingencies at this time. If you wanted a further accounting, we'd have to pull up those records. But each uh, week they're gone over in the project level, and then there's a monthly report on those statuses. Okay. All right. And you brought them on, uh, him on time, right? Yes, the time is, as you mentioned, uh, and we've got to all make up our mind this at this next workshop we have. but. Escalation, Mr. San Martino, well, you would know better, yes. uh, you know as well, uh, is going up, what? When you're looking at, well, not plywood's not as bad as it used to be, but. Generally generally speaking, uh, five to seven percent. I mean, CPI just, just came out, five to seven percent per, per year. You know, we just uh, got CPI released and it's seven percent for the last last year. And so right now, somewhere between that range is what, what we're seeing is the experience for uh, mm -hmm. Our budgets, basically. So, if we estimate today a job, we're recommending five to seven percent escalation, so that when you go to bid it a year later, it's it's close to budget. I was a political science major, but I believe five to seven percent of fifty million, pretty good number. It it, it, it is, and two and, and a half, three and a half million. And that's definitely why, when you look at the soft costs, you'll see an, a healthy number for escalation given the projection of time that's up on the screen. Okay. So, so the we, sooner we can get underway. The sooner we can get it. underway, Thank that's you. where the, the value goes. And and let's not forget these other items that are kind of buried in here and they're not as, you know, but having new electrical and and, and everything has to do with water and, and uh, electricity con conservation, those are going up, uh, you know, uh, tremendously even with uh, RPU. And I don't want us to forget if okay, it was brought up, the principal, that was something she had on her heart, was about the special education rooms. I don't know what those need, but I know from our experience with uh, team back here, those modulars that we are replacing, you know, dated back to the Kennedy era. I don't know. They, they were very old. And we want to treat those young people as equal as any husband. And, uh, and I do want us to arts from is very important, and so a lighting system and a sound system in our the in our, the Husky Theater, the North Theater, is extremely important to allow because they do have a lot of art projects and things they do at North that are wonderful. So, Mr. Hunt, do you know if you can grow a money tree in hydroponics? I, I, I've, got, I've got one in my, in my backyard. Well, that would be worth the investment. Years now. But yeah, it, it, we can't have everything. But I agree with former Principal Kinnear. Uh, about the presentation, the importance of the gym, not just because the, the Huskies are just you know so good in basketball, but it's about the use. And having two gyms under Title IX is, we would never build a school today without a big Title IX gym, which, which Martin Luther King is. But even that one with that side thing they've got isn't quite as efficient. And because, it, it, you know, if you've got a junior varsity game and the varsity's going on, it really isn't any place for me to go watch my junior varsity daughter. So I just think these two together, and if the, if the gym goes down, it all goes down. This way we have an alternative. All right. Thank you, Mr. I Trent. like what I've seen. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. All Thank right, you. we'll go to Ms. Alvey, and then maybe we can summarize yep. Ms. Hill. Yep. Very quickly. My niece, um, Polly's student, says that walking across Polly's campus now is like being on a com community college campus. And I think that's given the kids a lift because 
it elevates you to be on that campus. But I want to point out to you that the poly that got the auxiliary gym didn't have to invest as much in, in their science classrooms. Their science classrooms were pretty good because they were in that science building that we did with Measure B. And they were in pretty good shape. Uh, what I want to point out is that Norths are not in good shape. North science rooms are not in good shape. It's not a matter of changing countertops. You know, I don't want to do just a little DYI thing, okay? It's, it has to be substantial enough to where it feels like a modern science classroom. So whatever we do, there has to be a standard of excellence there. And uh, that's all I want to say. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvey. Um, Ms. Hill, I'm going to turn it to you to... Turn it to me, right? Thanks, Mr. Well, Lee. I know we've, we've all got a chance to weigh in. Yes. Um, and I think you've been able to hear the laundry list of priorities from various board members. And I don't know if there's any clarifying questions from our partners or from staff. Um, and then if, if not, then maybe we can summarize. I have one question heard. because there's going to have to be a trade off between something. So I did have one question. I think I can base it on option two. Um, if you go to slide 12, where um, the NPR is being modernized. I mean, the NPR is being updated, but Principal Gonzalez said that's where they have dance. If those services were not placed there, could they be incorporated into a, a, a new building? If we were doing a new building someplace, maybe to replace portables. Uh, in other words, how not to take away the NPR. <laughs> right, and we understand that. That was part of our discussion when we had the committee meetings. Part of the solution included um, being able to host those events in the auxiliary gym. So we were proposing to move anything okay. that happens currently in the NPR to happen in the auxiliary gym. Okay. Since there are like meetings and training and uh, you know, cheerleading, practice, and all those things. So that's what this option proposes. But if they need to have a permanent building, then we will need to look into a, a, an addition to this option. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Lee is difficult because I don't see an across the board commonality. Um, How much is the science classroom modernization? Because I didn't see that on option six. We don't build a new science building, but we modernize the existing science classrooms. It says 3.8 and 2.7, right? Sci but that says science to general ed classroom conversion. Is that the same thing? Should it? No, sorry. Uh, options. Okay, so option. M2 addresses the science classrooms and wings 200 and 300. Option M3, which is separated from 200 and 300 because it's a newer building, includes the uh, modernization of the science classrooms and building 700. But they would remain science classrooms? Because when I read that, it says science to general ed classroom conversion. So are you, is that converting a science classroom to a general ed classroom? Correct. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's what happens. Every main uh, science classrooms. It doesn't yeah. seem like they have an option that's, just for modernizing. Well, I mean, there's science. one here, like under option four, under the third option. It says science classroom modernization. So are you saying that is the same thing as what you just said at number six, or is it just not listed?
Or is the, yeah, the science classrooms in 200 and 300? Yeah, but that's not all the science 200 and 300 is, are some of the science classrooms? Yeah, okay. that's not all. Because there's also science classrooms in building 700. Maybe some clarity on that. That would be, be helpful if we're trying to somehow accomplish some gym and some science. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Farouk. And I, I just want to be clear. I'm not advocating for some kind of s small touch with the, the classrooms to me is, and, and the gym are the most important things. But um, mm -hmm. all I'm, uh, what I meant by my comment was that there, there could be some more surgical approach. It doesn't mean to, to not do it at a high caliber or not to do it extensively. It's right. Just, right. It, it, it's, it's more of a procedural thing that involving um, from a regulatory standpoint what triggers what. It's... That's what I was referring to. He, Mr. San Martin knows it was more of an inside baseball kind of thing. It's not intended to imply that I'm trying to do something very light with the classrooms. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Or Renee? So I, I just want to check with the team. I said I don't I see. Do you guys see a thread in the in the preferences listed? So I'll, I'll take a stab at it, but mm -hmm. I was taking notes as I was listening. Yes. And there's there's two themes that uh, that come up, and it's definitely a, a science classroom theme and a gym theme. And there's different ways to approach that. It could be a modernization or new. And depending on which way you want to lean the budget for the dollars, it sounds like pick up some savings here. You kind of go more in the modernization for for the science. But with those kind of two new main aspects to the campus, uh, still want to have some kind of presence on either side of the streets when you're entering and uh, going to kind of a, a feel for wherever you are on the campus that the campus has been upgraded. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'd say that's probably the third theme that no matter which way you lean the budget for gym or uh, classroom science, that has to be a constant um, among them. Uh, I say if we had those three uh, themes come to the top, there's some other discussion points, obviously, that, that come into play for where can we pick up some other things with those themes. But that's, as I took a page of notes and I listened to everyone on there, that, that's what I captured. Okay. I, I would say I think that's a very astute and accurate, at least from my perspective, how capturing it. So if, I guess my comment to that would be, is there something within uh, some kind of middle ground to, to the scope of those various things to make, to reconcile all three of those priorities. Because I think, I, again, I don't know if there will be full consensus on everything, but I think that to me captures like as much commonality as you can have is those three things, the, the classrooms, the, uh, the, the gymnasium, and then some degree of beautification. I, I think from the value of this meeting tonight, at least for, for me, uh, hearing this input, this feedback, for us to kind of, because we're trying to take it down to something within a framework that we can work with that has direction so that we can get going on the design. I, I think from, from this discussion, we can probably summarize this and, and show in scope, schedule, and budget what, what we're hearing and bring it back. To provide options. One comment I would just have respectfully, uh, President Lee, is that I think in the, because we know that the longer we wait, the less money that there will be uh, from an escalation standpoint. Obviously, the, the money is fixed. Uh, so I really think that if we're going to be potentially looking at this as an action item at the next board meeting, is that what we're looking at? If, if that's the goal, I think in the interest of making sure we, f we maintain that schedule, that if in between the board meeting, if uh, any of us need to come out and do an additional site visit and give you more feedback, the, I, I, again, it doesn't guarantee that we'll have a consensus then, but I just want to make sure that there's no additional reason where we're then confronted with the information at the next meeting and we still have questions and we may lose another three weeks or whatever. And, uh, so I, I, I personally will commit to being accessible and doing the, the putting yeah. in that work if that's helpful. Yeah, I think, and I think all I think all of us would do that. And I know, again, we're not making any decisions. And I promised Mr. Kinnear that we weren't going to give too much direction because uh, we know how much uh, involvement. And I thank you, Mr. Hunt, for taking the time, Mr. With Mr. Kinnear, um, but we want to make sure he can weigh in because we know he 
he has, uh, I'm sure, a lot to say. So maybe he said he was going to watch this meeting when he could this weekend. So he'll get filled in, and then I'm sure staff can sit down with him. And then um, based upon the conversations that you've heard this evening, putting together potential seventh option or eighth option would be, I think, helpful. Uh, Mr. Hunt, last question. I would be interested, as we've talked before, in it, we're going to take science classroom one and we're going to turn it into, as Mrs. Dalby discussed, into something presentable and it's modern, et cetera, and so forth. So that cost a dollar. I want to know, and, and we're, we're going to build a brand new building over here that is going to cost X per square foot. How much more would it be if that brand new building was science? And then going back to the dollar for that building to retrofit it to science, what, what would it cost to take that classroom and rip it out and just make it a regular classroom, you know, for all other social studies and literature, et cetera? Is, is there, and if I do it now, I'm just saving it. If, if, as, I'm sorry, uh, ma'am, I, I forgot your name. Our My name is Jason, but that's okay. My name is Jason. Indiana. Oh, Indiana. Indiana. Sorry. Julia, all right, ma'am. Um, you alluded that a science room can cost more, obviously. So, do we, and it's so, if this is a, just a generic classroom, the new one, how much more does it cost if we make it a science classroom versus how much more is, what's the difference between converting this existing poor science room, uh, you know, ancient, to a modern, uh, or do we, do we take that money and put it over here to enhance the building that becomes a science building and then what does it cost us to rip, remove, put the carpet down, and all the things that a literature class would need. Okay. Thank all you. right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank um, you, Brent. Any, anybody else before I, we're gonna take a short break, but again, I wanna make sure, I don't know if anybody from the design committee is here that helped with the initial options that were presented. Uh, are, is anybody here? If they could stand, we could recognize you. If not, I hope we can send a nice, uh, yes. Thank you, Noda. Maybe we can recognize them at a future meeting. Um, so again, thanks to the design committee and thank you, Principal Gonzalez, for being here and for, for bringing everyone together over the course of the last year, I'd say, uh, maybe longer. Um, and I hope that you're taking notes too, either in your mind, Principal Gonzalez, about um, some of the feedback that you've heard. If, if we sound like we're completely missing what needs to be done in North, maybe tell us privately so we don't look silly but uh, all right so with that um, we'll end this item um, and we'll take a short 10 minute break and then we'll hear the last item uh, of the evening so thanks again everybody thank you Jason thank you Liliana thank you Sergio thanks to your whole team Anna everybody
you could please please find your seat and we'll get started. There's two items left, I'm sorry. Look, you're gonna show me up by any tip. All right, welcome back everybody. <clears throat> we're uh, on item number two. We're going to get pro we will be provided with a update on our multi-tiered system of support, MTSS, and inclusive practices. Um, I believe Dr. Lewis is going to kick off this presentation. So thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, board members. Tonight, our team is going to provide an update on our additional supports that we provided to schools, students, and families, aligned through a tiered response. As set forth by the Board of Education, multi-tiered systems of support will help us accomplish two district priorities. One, well-being for all, and two, focusing on student learning as we return to campus. In relationship to our ongoing work priorities, MTSS is anchored in our COVID response plan to support students and educators alike. Our goal is to provide the best classroom experience and meet student need as they return to campus. I'd like to introduce Dr. Sosa and Mrs. Frausto who will provide the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. The work of MTSS framework is guided and grounded in our district Y. Here is our district's vision statement. Clearly, it states that we believe all students are entitled and engaged in engaging, innovative, and equitable experiences for all students. This is our North Star for MTSS. And as you saw within our vision statement, we believe in equity here in our USD because at its essence, MTSS is about equity providing a system in which all students get what they need in order to thrive. This work helps us ensure that RUSD lives up to its equity goals that we have set for ourselves. When we think about multi-tiered systems of support, this encompasses the whole child, social emotionally, behaviorally, and with respect to academics. We know that children bring their whole selves to school we do this work because it's the best way we know to support for reaching our goals to help support college, career, world-ready students, but more importantly, because it's the right thing to do. These types of supports are often referred to as tiered supports. They first begin with universal supports for all students, which is the foundation of any multi-tiered system best described in our graphic as the bottom of that pyramid. These types of supports are universally designed by teachers in classrooms every single day, taking the needs of their students in mind when they design lessons from the beginning and supporting students within the general education classroom. Next, for some of our students that need just a little bit of additional help, we look at targeted supports for our students. These are supports provided to students in addition to what they continue to receive in the general education classroom. These uh, types of supports can occur in many different models. Most occur within the general education classroom and from time to time, they may occur somewhere else. For a very few group of students, we have those most um, intensive supports for those youngsters that need supports over and above the targeted level, but still within the general education classroom. The main takeaway from this graphic of multi-tiered systems of support is this. We believe that students should remain in the core general education classroom as much as possible. When they receive support, it should be in addition to what they receive in the classroom every day from their hardworking classroom teacher.
Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Our MTSS supports our ultimate goal of inclusive practices, which is one of our equity tenets. Inclusive practices goes beyond students with differing abilities being in the same classroom at the same time and really emphasize the development of all of our students as expert learners so that they can engage in those opportunities to learn. They can be supported and they can be challenged, as Dr. Sosa said, in the general education um, classroom. In addition, inclusive practices really embraces student differences and learning differences as assets rather than as deficits. And research shows that inclusive practices really increases student outcomes and closes those achievement gaps of historically marginalized student populations. So we are partnering with a company called Collaborative Learning Solutions who has extensive experience and expertise in creating uh, inclusive practices and MTSS in large and small districts across the nation. They've worked with schools, districts, all over the country, including Fresno Unified, who's a large school district here in California and is recognized by the Department of Education as a leading exemplary model in MTSS and inclusive practices. Unfortunately, they couldn't be with us tonight. They are actually presenting at the AXA Equity or Child, I think it's chi Every Child Counts Symposium, so they couldn't be with us tonight, but they'll be with us in the future. The supports that we're looking at are range all the way from consultation to coaching, professional learning, as well as assistance in data and communication. We're working with our district guiding coalition, which is made up of stakeholders, representatives from district leadership, as well as from site administrators, our employee associations, students, and parent groups. They advise us on development of our action plan and also help us to cascade important communication across the community and across the district. We are also leveraging our shared leadership systems that we already have in place for coaching and professional learning to our school site leadership teams and also our educational services staff who are focused on teaching and learning. Our educational outcomes for the end of this first year include developing explicit behavioral expectations at all of our sites. In addition, it is to support the transition from social emotional learning and isolated lessons provided periodically throughout the year to this integration of the skills in our lessons and subject areas throughout the day and consistent use of community circles across all of our schools. We are also focused on systematic use of our screening data so that we can inform instruction. Through the leadership and guidance of the Board of Education, as well as our district cabinet, we've been able to add school site staff to support students academically, behaviorally, and social emotionally through the use of MTSS. On the far left, there you see the supports that we're providing to staff. And this begins with our MTSS liaisons. They help teams to plan, to look at data and to plan lessons and also to match interventions to student needs. They also provide coaching to teachers right in the classroom with their classes and teach alongside them, helping them to adjust lessons so that all students needs are met within that general education classroom. We also have inclusive practices specialists, which is a new position we've also added. They focus on that same work, but it's focused on ensuring that students in special education are successfully participating in general education and increasing that. We actually have an example of two students who right before the break we're making the transition from special education classes to general education classes. And our MTSS liaison and inclusive practices specialist partnered to support and meet with the teachers prior to the students making that transition and offer suggestions and strategies 
And then the inclusive practices specialist was there on the day that the students transitioned and, and checked in throughout the week. And it really ensured that success for students. And I'm happy to say they're doing very well in their general education classes now. On the right, we also have supports, direct supports for students focused on social emotional. We have had the opportunity to increase school and add MTSS counselors and also our SAP counselors. They partner together to meet the needs of students and at elementary, the two elementary schools will share an MTSS counselor and a SAP counselor. While we've had SAP counselors in the past, this is the first time we've had a school counselor on an elementary campus. And it's working very well. This is a fantastic partnership to meet the needs of our students. In secondary, we've added an MTSS counselor and we've increased our SAP counselors to full time. And our high schools actually have two SAP counselors now. This is really beneficial to our students because we're increasing that amount of time and the services that we can provide them, direct services, and increasing the trusted adults they have on campus to build those relationships with. We've been able to provide more whole group lessons as well as providing more small group, intentional small group lessons, and then one-to-one -one sessions. And this can focus on everything from grief to stress management to learning how to resolve conflict to goal setting to learning to recognize and respond to emotions. And then in addition, we have positions on site campuses already supporting this work with site administrators, counselors, prevention assistants, and campus supervisors. Our Care Solace partnership, of course our Family Resource Center, and then this year our Wellness Centers at two of our sites. We're only four months into this journey, and it's a four to five year long journey, but despite being at the beginning, we've already accomplished a lot. We've provided three rounds of training to Ed Services and school leadership teams. We have a common RUSD MTSS definition for the first time that's inclusive of our why. We're developing those district systems or district structures and school systems to support the whole child. And we've taken a deep dive into social emotional learning strategies that can be incorporated into the classroom lessons. All of this will help us get to that sustainability that really outlives any one person and all of us that will be able to support the district in the many years to come. So let's take a closer look at that MTSS common definition that Ms. Rausto was just speaking of. That definition that you see before you was framed and created by that guiding coalition that Ms. Frosta was speaking of that involves both members inside and outside of our organization. Something that I'd like to point out that is a huge move forward for us is this is the first time within our district that this work of multi-tiered systems of support has had a common definition that everybody can point to, that it's not a special project going on here or a pilot project going on here that other people can define. But it's something as a system we've come together to establish this is what we are all about. The objective of this definition and really of this work is to build a fluid system that is student-centered, grounded in database decision-making, that is intentional to provide supports for students to thrive. We've chosen to begin this work by focusing on social emotional learning or sometimes referred to as SEL for all of our students here in the district. We've done that for many reasons, but I'd like to highlight two reasons in particular. When we were planning this work early on, we recognized from the research that all students would be returning back to school having been exposed to some level of trauma with the pandemic. Research tells us that trauma can have a devastating impact on student learning, both in the present and in the long term. Research also told us that if we address social emotional learning as a system, 
not only will it have immediate impact for students, but it will have long-term impact for the students that come after. The graphic that you see on the screen shows what the research talks about uh, protective factors or those things we can build into the system that help hedge against trauma that students and really adults and all humans face within the world. There are three that I would like to highlight just very quickly. Safety, voice and choice, and skill building. For safety, we know that when students are supported and cared for in positive, caring school environments, they are less likely to abuse substances, to become involved in negative behaviors and activities that take them away from their learning. For voice, we also know that students do better when they have opportunities to participate within their own learning and in the process. That's one of the reasons why our social emotional screening is so impactful, because we are asking students themselves how they feel and what they think about this process. And finally, skill building, because we know that it's very clear. When adults in the system have high expectations for students and we provide supports for students to meet those expectations, students do better. We've been at this work for about five months now, and we already have things that we would like to celebrate. There on the screen, you see just a couple of markers of that success that I wanted to share with you. During this time in our initial screening for social emotional learning, we screened over 31,000 students within our district. That only, are, uh, that is not only huge work for us here in Riverside, but there are very few districts in the Inland Empire that are doing that scale of social emotional support. That helps us be able to match skills and um, supports you've provided in the system with what students are telling us that they need right in the moment. There's been a 28% decrease in special education referrals just during this time period. Now that's not to say that students are not getting support, but what that tells us is that students are getting more support within their classroom that's leading to less decisions to find support elsewhere within our system, which is really great for kids all around. That final number that I'd like to share is 65%. That tells us that 65% of our elementary school students who qualify for special education are getting the amount of time that we want them to be in the general education classroom. It's called least restrictive environment. It means students are spending more time in their general education classroom and less time away. Just to give a little context to that number, both our district goal and the state goal was 54%. So we are already exceeding that goal by 11% just at the beginning of this work. We not only measure what we're doing and providing for students, but we also measure our success with how we're providing learning for the adults. When we provide learning for the adults, we ask them a series of questions that help us get better. Two of those figures that I'd like to draw your attention to are 53 and 76. 53% of our uh, teachers and staff who go for training say they feel they have a strong um, understanding before they enter, but after they finish that professional learning, 76% of them report having a strong sense that they've increased their knowledge. That's a 23% increase, which leads to what we call collective efficacy them uh, staff feeling stronger and more um, effective in what they do, which research tells us impacts student learning tremendously. In addition, we are collecting feedback from, in addition to that feedback, we're collecting statements from our participants. And in our first round, we asked them about what was wow for them and what was now. And I, while I won't share all of them with you, a couple that I'd like to highlight is that the definition of MTSS they feel is really challenging us to dig deeper for our kids. 
And while this is a major shift, it's also a much needed revision in how we do what we do for students. And now we're creating environments where the minds and spirits of children can thrive. Staff are feeling motivated, connected, optimistic, encouraged, and they're feeling heard and validated. But it all hasn't all been roses either. There have been a lot of challenges. As we know, our staff is overwhelmed and they're tired. But we have just extraordinary, extraordinary RUSD staff members who are showing up to these trainings. They're showing up to work every day, providing the best that they can for students and recognizing that this is the right work right now, that our students and our families and staff need this in this moment to respond to the impacts of COVID. And while we had 50 school sites in various departments and divisions starting in, a, in different places at the beginning of this journey just a few months ago, when we collect their staff commitments, all of that narrows into just four themes, which is remarkable when we're thinking about all of the staff across the district. Those commitments are to integrate SEL into lessons and language, to being more intentional and deliberate in our interactions with students, to really building that community and connection, and of course, looking at data, which coincides with our three outcomes that we hope to achieve by the end of this year. We are very excited to continue building and learning and growing this system as we continue this work over time. And that concludes this part of the presentation. If there's any public comments or comments from the board. Ms. Martin, anything from, nope. Okay, great, I'll, then I'll open it up to the board. Thank you. So I've been very familiar with the, the pyramid, the MTSS pyramid for many years. But it sounds like what you're doing this year is completely new. Is this because of our, have, have we taken a look at this through a new lens with COVID and the learning loss? What has sparked this new change? Because I, I'm feeling very inspired by what you've said. Thank you, Ms. Alvey, that's a great question. The answer would be yes, we are learning from the current reality, but we are also going back to what research tells us really works for kids. And that's not to say that the work the district did in the past wasn't targeted, uh, but there's been a general um, understanding that we've grown, that academics doesn't just um, live in a bubble that many other things impact that, and that when we address the whole child, those successes are uh, exponential for students. And so we are taking a look at that and putting it into action. You're really getting results, it sounds like, very quickly, which is very inspiring. And um, I'm also very excited by this increase in SAP staff and counselors and these liaisons. This, is, this was all new this year, correct? This is, uh, this is very exciting. Yes, we're very uh, using that ESSER funds uh -huh. very intentionally around the needs of our students, and that's what's allowed us to add this staff in order to do that. So you bring up a good point. So ESSER funds aren't gonna last forever. So we're gonna have to be looking at our LCAP a little bit differently. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Okay. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, great job, uh, again, your whole team. And, and uh, as Trustee Ali mentioned, uh, MTSS has always been, I think, a bright spot for our district's leadership in general. And I would say uh, the fact that we had such a good, robust foundation and framework on MTSS prior to the pandemic, I think that helped us uh, pivot and kind of uh, be able to re react much more effectively the way that you guys have done it. So that's fantastic. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, students. so you had, there was a slide in here about um, students, uh, let me see, imp uh, uh, implementation metrics. Uh, it's a pretty s substantial amount of uh, people being uh, engaged uh, or, or, or on a variety of different areas. My only question is, is though still, what was the basis of 
which students you chose because even the 31,000 is a lot. It's not the totality of all of our students. So I just want to understand what your thought process was. Yes, that's a great question. So we actually have a three-year implementation plan for our universal screener. And so uh, because we're a large district, because we're uh, 40,000 plus students in our district, it's too much to bite off to be able to screen all students with all three screeners at one time. Um, even in the best scenario, that, that would be a tall order. Knowing that our focus was on social emotional learning, that's where we started, was, was there. Uh, that figure, as we get into the middle screening period, which actually is occurring right now, will be much, much closer to that total number um, of enrollment. We had uh, some initial challenges with bringing the screener online, as you would uh, kind of suspect with any new uh, implementation in terms of data quality and just making sure everybody was trained. And that led us to that 31,000 number. That number of 18,000 and 17,000, that first year of implementation is screening just elementary students with the academic screeners. And so that's why there's such a big difference it looks like on paper of why that number is different, but we're very close to screening all students. And there's nuance to that. We have about 21,000 elementary students, but some students are not at a developmental level to be able to access the screener and those types. Of so I hope that that answers that question. Yeah, that, that definitely helps. And then my next question is, uh, I, again, as Trustee Alvi mentioned, it, a lot of these things that you're doing are very timely with respect to the pandemic. My question, I guess, is in terms of like your mode and delivery, uh, how have you, how has that changed or adapted given those circumstances? How, uh, how, how, in terms of the mode of execution, I guess, to these out goals you outlined. A clarifying question: the mode of execution for students or staff or both in terms of implementing supports. I implementing MTSS to those. To whether it's employees or for the students uh, for that from that standpoint the I think, program itself yeah thank you I think one thing that we are doing a little bit differently this year also is working very intentionally with the school leadership teams and the site administrators so site administrators have the opportunity to select their school leadership teams based on the needs of their site rather than us asking for them to bring certain representatives from certain areas so you have very committed and engaged staff that are there and already taking this work back to their sites and delivering staff meetings and model lessons and things of that nature for their staff at their site. So they're hearing it from their colleagues. That's been very, very helpful. In addition, we've also, as Dr. So said, looking at that research, really focusing on the whole child and those direct supports to students. So being able to support staff and teach alongside them versus in the past, we were sending students out to other staff. So, so the staff on that one diagram, all the staff in the additions, a lot of that's working in partnership with the classroom teacher to provide those supports within the classroom and in addition to what's in the classroom versus a teacher being in, an, in another room on another part of the campus and then being identified to go out of the classroom, receive that support, and then come back, which creates some discontinuity with their learning. Okay, my last question. Uh, with respect to the board itself, at what point uh, is it helpful for us to provide any additional support or feedback on how, is it during the annual LCAP cycle? Is, is that when we really weigh in? I just wanna understand how the board can be helpful on this. So you're correct, Dr. Ruth. There's actually two more places. One will come as Dr. Perez and they work through the LCAP. And to Mrs. Alibi's question, you'll hear supplement on concentration. There is a long-term plan to use our best practices that we discovered, as well as we will bring back our regular presentations to keep the board not only updated, but to get your feedback of what you're hearing and how we're progressing through. So two different points in the spring, one through LCAP and one through another update. Excellent. Thank you again for all your work. Mr. Hunt. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, for those questions. Thank you all for the report. Um, you, you said, sir, that they, 
you're listening to their students and they're telling what are our students telling you in this most unprecedented time in a, over 100 years uh, for something that nobody knew how to deal with caught everybody um, where their homes have been disrupted their lives their normalcy what are they saying to you that's a great question thank you mr Hunt, for the question it's a good question but go ahead. <laughs> When we look at that social emotional screening data, there are some things that jump out. One of the pieces I think that jumped out quickest was how resilient our students are. So not to get into too much detail, but the screener has different levels of support based upon how students answer it, recommends a certain level of support. We'd like to shoot for students to about 80% of students to need low support. That would indicate that what's going on within our system is working to support almost all kids. When we screened students for the first time, we saw that generally about 71% of students told us that they need a low level of support, which would indicate what we're doing was hitting the mark. But when we dug deeper into what the, the other 30% of students were telling us, it was all across the board. We were seeing students that were telling us they feel a high level of anxiety, not only for what's going on at school, but for what's going on at home. We heard students tell us that they have a tough time dealing with stress, that they have a tough time in um, the isolation that was felt due to COVID. And so knowing those things helps us to then have really targeted conversations with school sites about what kind of support can they need, right? Targeting the students just where they are to be able to support them. Are you finding that, uh, I mean, it's sort of obvious, but you're finding that it affects their learning even in a back in the classroom situation. And, I mean, if, if I'm upset and I have to bring myself together, it's hard to do my job. If electrician, God forbid, you know, is he, yeah, and he's going to electrocute himself. So I sure as heck don't want my heart searching to be having a bad day. So uh, tell me about, I don't mean to joke about it, but it's, I, I read a Brown University uh, health system study. Uh, and this is for the holidays where uh, uh, they say that night, uh, uh, that cases among girls of self-harm, et cetera, has risen 90%. Boys were about half that, but Boys aren't going to come forward and tell you, it sounds like they're weak. I used to be a boy. So it, it, they're going to do that. But I'm very concerned about it. I've talked to uh, Dr. Hill, I mean, Superintendent Hill about this and my colleagues that I really think we have to look at, and I'm making a thing now, but that we have to look at, we're still doing a lot of the same things that we're doing. We're doing these special programs. That's great. Mrs. Alby pointed out, Esser, Lynn, but it, we really should be looking at what post-traumatic is in right. syndrome for and giving them skills with with all respect you know my mom and dad went through the depression and then the war and all that um so they gave me some skills how to deal with stuff i lived in march and they thought they're gonna drop the bomb on any day uh, but a lot of the, the parents today haven't had to go through they went through the 80s and the crash and all that i'm not saying we need to help families even develop how we, uh, you know, act, exercises at home and, and then having our kids talk to each other and, and being up front with them. Uh, because I'm, I'm concerned, you can get the answer, I interrupt you, but uh, about the effect in the classroom. Yes, no problem. I'll um, give just two quick examples and then I, I think one of the things you were talking about sometimes is referred to as um, trauma um, informed practices or TIP sometimes, right? That that um, concept that students have all kinds of things happening to them, they bring that to the classroom and we help them to cope with it and then the teachers help. And I, I'm gonna, I would turn to, to my friend Kirsten to be able to address that. But your first question about what are we seeing the impact of the classroom, I have to say yes. So I've had two experiences, I've had many experiences looking at the data, but I wanna highlight two just really quickly. Um, recently I had an opportunity to sit with one of our principals and we, um, looked at that person's student data and looked at the grade data kind of opposed to each other, right? There were some times where the social emotional screener 
might answer some questions that that person was not able to answer about why a student was performing the way they were. So it does have a direct impact. Just as impactful was when that uh, individual noticed that there were students that were high achieving, yet were high level of support in other areas. That they weren't manifesting that coming out, but the student was telling us on the screener they were asking for help. And it's those types then that the light bulbs went off in that individual. Conversations like that I've had also with our counselors going through the data and helping them understand that and how they can leverage their supports and all the great work that they do, both with students who, are sh who we know are performing poorly academically or that need support, and then other kids that might on the surface look like they have it together, but the screener data, they're telling us they need help. And so it's a different kind of conversation, but super impactful about how we can do things differently than we've done before. I think that 15, 20, and 50 years from now, part of how we all will be judged, the adults that are at this time, is how we reacted, not just to all the craziness, but how we reacted to ensuring that the social emotional of children who become adults and who then take over, that it, it, it gave them coping. They gave them opportunities to speak to others. They gave them ideas. They gave them care and to me that's more important right now than homework and if we can find the time uh, to do that because uh, there's a gentleman who has a wonderful garage in indiana repair name's jim jim's about 70s or something and i was chatting with him before the holidays i saw some stuff he was a marine i got a tattoo he's a marine and he got the talking and then he was telling me a story about he's in vietnam and 300 men go in and eight days later, 12 come out. What they went through, he was shot the first day. And you can see it affects him. And he says, yeah, Tom, I do have trouble sleeping. Said, He's 70. He was there and he was 19. This is a different, I mean, obviously bullets and all that. But this is every day. And, I, and it's a good article the other day about uh, pandemic fatigue, you know. And you can see it in different levels, denial all the way to whatever. I mean, we're all tired. It will be Two months from tomorrow, Mrs. Alavi is the the date of our board meeting that we had to shut the schools, and uh, uh, you know the uh, amount of cases today I had it here a little while ago versus a year ago today recorded are uh, uh, nearly quadruple, and so and as you know it's it hurting her. So mom and dads are sick at home. What do I do? I'm a little fellow. Or I'm, how do I help? I mean, it's just. Nothing of normalcy is left, you know, and so whatever we can do, I, I think we should prioritize it. But I appreciate what y'all are doing. I appreciate very much, uh, Ms. Russ Rosemont, what you do for special ed. But I mentioned to everyone that we need to improve the special ed rooms at North, and uh, and we should. But uh, thank you. This is an encouraging report, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Mr. or Dr. Farouk, did you have something? One quick request. Uh, I, I'm glad you included some of the feedback that, like, about the being overwhelmed and anxiety. It's not just purely the positives because we, as a board, want the the reality of it. But uh, can we get a copy of uh, if you could email us all of the the comments uh, that were provided? I think it'd be helpful for us to see that. Thank you. It's two quick things for me. Thank you. Really appreciate the presentation. All the work uh, that we're doing. Um, to address some of those needs um, that our, our students are participating in. And I know you said it's a, we're just a few months into a, a three-year process, but it's encouraging to see that, you know, results so quickly and, and mostly positive results. So that that's, seems like we're on the right track and the work needs to continue. Um, I, I, one question about the data, about the number of students that we've, we've um, assessed, is that the correct word, assessed. So were those, it was like 18 and 17, were those unique students? So a total of 31 or we've done 31,000 assessments? Oh, that's a great question. The 18 and 17 would be the same group of students. One is for um, the academic screener in reading and one is for the academic screener okay, in so mathematics. It's, okay, got it. So we've done that many screenings, but it's about 17,000 students that we've we've worked on. Okay, great. Um, and then you, you did touch on a little bit, 
and Dr. Farouk just mentioned it too, about some of the, the additional, I mean, I, I guess with our staff right now, uh, like across all industries, just everybody's kind of overwhelmed. Uh, and I know that uh, we've heard in the past from uh, our teachers that, you know, don't add anything else to our plate. Let us, let us deal with what's on our plate right now. Let us get that right before we add anything else. So have we had any feedback about concerns about additional requirements, meetings, trainings, um. We have uh, done a, I think, very intentional in working with our, our sites in terms of the trainings that we're providing. So it's five this year. It did feel a little, a little overwhelming in the beginning, but I think they've seen the value in coming. And of course, right now we've put a pause because of the impacts that we're experiencing so that we can get through this beforehand. Also, um, you know, all of the staff in the district done an amazing job of supporting teachers with this. And while it is a shift, it isn't, I don't think they feel necessarily that it's more being added on. Where it comes in is it's a, it's a change in how they're delivering instruction versus sometimes when we're adding a new adoption or something like that, it's learning something all new and, and delivering things very differently. So this has been, um, well, it is a, a challenge. I think they also recognize and are finding tools because they're experiencing the challenges in classroom right now. The kids are showing up, families are experiencing challenges, and they were asking for tools. How do I support students in my classroom with the needs that they have right now? And I think they feel like coming is time well spent because we're giving them those tools and they can go right away and implement them. So one of the data points on the slide, it was about professional development, is almost 80% of the teachers have a plan, or staff, because it's not just teachers, have a plan as soon as they get back to school to implement what they're learning. And that's a pretty high number. Many times we invest in professional development, sometimes that teachers go back and it isn't implemented for many different reasons. But they're finding extreme high value in this and it is meeting their needs and I think that's where we see that acknowledgement there. Perfect, thank you. Well, if there's nothing else from the board, just thank you Dr. Lewis, Dr. Sosa, Ms. Frausto and just the whole M MTSS team um, for, for the initial success and we, we look forward to staying apprised in the progress as, as we move through the three-year plan. One of our, our guiding coalition members oh, who perfect. was here tonight and stayed Thank through you. the whole whole presentation. Really nice. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being always so involved, and uh, we really appreciate all your your volunteerism and your knowledge. All right, so we're on to um, item number three, our last item of the evening um, uh, for the Board of Education to consider the use of virtual participation for public input during Board of Education meetings. Take it away, sir. President Lee, members of the board, uh, before you this evening is a presentation that's coming back in regard to the um, virtual participation for the public. Uh, we're going to give you an overview from a historical perspective of the emergency orders that were put in place, a background of the requirements of AB 361, the current practices that have been placed in then the considerations and next steps. Uh, emergency order N2920 allowed the Board of Education meetings to be conducted remotely without having to adhere to the traditional teleconference Board Act rules. It allowed members of the public to uh, um, attend virtually, and it also had public comment, which could be via email, voicemail, live video, or live telephone. It expired on September the 30th, 2021. AB 36, uh, 361 uh, allows the continued use of virtual meetings as long as there is a gubernatorial proclaimed state of emergency and either state or local health officials have imposed or recommended social distancing measures or a legislative body finding that meeting in person is an imminent risk to attendees. The bill was signed on September the 16th, 21. It was effective immediately upon signature and the sun sets on January the 1st, 
2024. The AB 30, uh, 361 requirement, if meeting is virtual, real-time public comment is required. Agenda must include information on how to access the meeting and provide comments remotely. And if technical problems arise that result in disruption of public access, no vote or other official action may take place until the public access is restored. I bring this up because although you're not considering at least at this time, to go to virtual meetings. If you have an element of the meeting that is virtual, this would come into play if there's a technical problem. Um, considerations are going to be shared next with posting of materials, public comments, accessibility to the public, and broadcasting. And I would invite up uh, Dr. Perez to pick up the presentation from here. Good evening and hello again. Um, these next few slides uh, provide some data points and just some practices that uh, we currently do, as well as highlight what the added factors would be for the virtual participation and any additional costs. So for posting of materials, what we currently do is use a Google form where participants can submit and they are reviewed by board members um, prior to the board meeting. It's regular staffing costs, so hours of employee time. Um, and if we added the virtual participation, there would not be any additional costs to do, continue doing that. Uh, with public Zoom participation, we do not currently do that. However, if we proceed down that path with added virtual participation um, or posting of materials and Zoom is used, we would um, ensure that the meeting ID and participation information is included in the board posting, as well as the cost for two employees um, <clears throat> to work overtime for the duration of the board meeting. For public comment, the considerations are similar with the addition of the bottom row around translation and interpretation. Um, that we currently have our interpreters uh, Translating to Spanish, interpreting to Spanish um, with live comments, and costs are over time for the duration of the meeting. We add virtual participation. Uh, there's no additional cost because we are already doing that. With accessibility to the public and in terms of broadcasting out on our YouTube channel, the considerations you see those on the left, and that includes our live stream, um, the audio and the staff who manages the audio for the board meeting. Uh, closed captioning, we do um, have a contract with a vendor to do the uh, captioning for the duration of the board meeting. We have our dedicated board meeting YouTube channel. Our translation interpretation and setting up minutes script and setup again. Broadcast is very similar to setting up a show because it is live real time and you see the additional costs um, there. These next two slides um, just provide some analytics from YouTube in terms of viewer data. Um, in this slide, you see uh, viewership from September to December of 2021, including English and Spanish live stream. So the chart shows the data spikes for viewership on board meeting days with new views and returning views. So we have uh, a little over 1,000 returning viewers, um, a little over 6,000 unique viewers. And we have gained uh, 66 additional subscribers to the channel. This chart, uh, chart, <laughs> this chart shows the average view duration uh, for the live stream over the same period of time. The average view duration, so these are for subscribed and unsubscribed viewers, is 21 minutes and 42 seconds. And then you also see the average uh, watch time or audience retention um, is the amount of time um, that viewers spend watching all of the videos. The fiscal impact, you'll just see the, um, uh, just the uh, number of staff in order for us to produce the, the board meetings, our contracted services, and the approximate cost in overtime and contracted services uh, based approximately on a six hour meeting. This next slide staff did um, compile and look at a comparison 
between our neighboring school districts and what they offer. Um, what I would just like to highlight is uh, that our USD definitely provides increased access to the public for our board meetings in comparison to our neighboring districts. And then lastly, this is just our summary side uh, slide that we do provide different access to the public with these various considerations. Um, with the summary that there are no requirements for broadcasting or recording board meetings um, as we continue to do what we do with providing all of these features for the broadcast. And that concludes the presentation. All right, thank you, Dr. Perez. Thank you, Mr. Walker. So we have two comment, two, uh, two public comments. First, Jason Hunter. My neighbor in BFF. I like that. It's a new year, Jason. Jason Hunter, I still don't remember exactly what district I'm in, but I am going to learn by the end of this year. I am going to learn what district I'm in. I'm in Ward 1. That's what I'm used to saying. So the, we're five. I'm in five. Um, how apropos that we just talked about inclusivity, the previous agenda item, because this item is 100% about not just inclusivity, but your entire DEI agenda. This is your shot to put our money where your mouth is in a positive fashion. As you know, I attend government meetings from time to time. You know what's missing? No, not the evidence of intelligence from up on the podium, okay? That's not what's missing. It is, uh, that's my public comment for another day. What's missing are significant portions of our community, okay? Look around and think about your meetings in general. Where are the elderly? Where are the disabled? Where are the single moms with four kids? Where are the folks who cannot afford or don't have access to transportation? Answer, they're not here because it is onerous for them to be here, and hence, they have been historically shut out of this process. And we are all losing out because of that, because no one group or individual has all the answers or the best answers. And, or, and, nor should anyone be shut out of petitioning their government over their grievances. And the pandemic has had its silver linings, because, uh, believe it or not, uh, and one of them has been is, is that uh, many of us have had to learn how to participate virtually in these meetings and learn this technology. Otherwise, we would have never have done it, quite frankly. Um, and we shouldn't waste that opportunity. We should be holding hybrid meetings here, uh, here with forth forever, um, because that would be best in kind community engagement. This is not hard, nor is it expensive. I routinely run meetings, I preside as chair, I call the speakers, enforce the rules, both in person and folks participating virtually. Guess what? All by my little self, it's not that difficult. Look around at how many staff are in this meeting. You're saying we can't dedicate one person of all these people sitting around here to run the Zoom meeting, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist. Uh, and secondly, PS, for any of you, who worry that by going virtual, you may not see my pretty face as often as you have had in the past. I can assure you, I only live five minutes away. I would walk here barefoot on broken glass to, do, to address this board in person. So you don't have to worry about that. Let's get it done. This is long overdue. It doesn't just solve a here and now problem. It solves a historical problem when it comes to access by different segments who have been underrepresented historically in this community. Let's get it done. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Um, Sandy R. So Zoom had previously um, been in effect and the district, you know, decided to discontinue it, even though its use was extended by the governor that you guys um, never want to challenge, but clearly you did for this topic. Um, the district can't have it both ways. They can't claim that COVID is a dangerous and um, public health, you know, emergency, and yet not provide opportunities for people to engage remotely. This is discriminatory to people with health issues who would prefer not to attend in person. The district's excuse of the expense as the reason not to resume Zoom is laughable. 
the district received $151 million in ESSER funds. The cost is less than $10,000. And the fact that you want to use that as an excuse not to allow the public to have this source of engagement is inexcusable. Um, if engagement is your issue, I can assure you that I'm doing my best to increase your engagement on the YouTube channel. The reason the durations are shorter is because I tell them to skip to the good parts. Um, and I think that people watching the YouTube channel and watching this presentation is the best advertisement for a new board because your own words are the best advertisement for that. People get to hear directly from you what you think or your rude comments that you make to us. Like for instance, today, the comment that you made about you can't enforce anything. So I'd like to use my last bit of time. Oh, I understand. But you, on July 8th, thank you, this is my time. Thank you. Yeah. On July 8th, you were very clear with us. Oh, darn, I'm not getting service. July 8th, you were very clear with us that you could mandate things. If you could, you know, make them wear shoes, you could make them wear masks, and you could mandate things because you were a separate government entity. So July 8th, I'll happily let people know what time to skip to so they don't have to watch the whole six-hour meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orr. All right. I'll open it up for the board for any questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Walker and Dr. Perez, it's one of the finest, most comprehensive analytical reports I've received, and I understand it much better. Uh, I do want to ask you about, because I'm, I'm concerned about, well, it, Mr. Walker, on page five, third bullet point, please. If they could, if they could put that up, please. Okay. What's your question? So my question, this I understand, if technical problem, so we're having this meeting in person here, which is part of the, well, you have to do it. Plus we have the Zoom or whatever the call yes. is. And it, the electronic part of it. If the electronic part of it goes down, it ends the meeting because those folks are then left out. It, well, if you run into a problem where the public who is participating via Zoom or other means of participation virtually cannot give public input on an item that is an action item, you cannot take action on that item. So we, we would, all right, so got that. Um, you know, I first came on this board, I tried to advocate and wasn't successful. I had support down at the end of the table there, but I always thought about the moms in Orange Crest who wanted to come down, or the moms in the East Side that, that can't have the transportation to get and say what they want to say, so that we should be on it. We could have done the television thing at those times. So I'm, I always support this, but what bothers me is that, tech, that bullet. Our job is to continue to advance the district and uh, to have a, get, a glitch with Zoom uh, negate the ability, the uh, capacity and, and the responsibility of a school board to take action um, until it's restored is, is, is uh, worrisome. So my point, Dr. Press, is you have two, I, I know everybody has staff shortages. I know that, that you lost some people to the, district, uh, the uh, county office, I think, in this area. And, uh, how can the, do we have the staff to handle this sort of thing? And if, in a, if a situation like this would occur, uh, how would we get that? What do you have to do to get back on other than, you know, turn it off and turn it back on? But I mean, what happens? Um, well, I wouldn't be able to speak to the precise, like, technical difficulties that would happen, but mm -hmm. um, we would want to secure two employees who we could train to do, um, uh, manage the Zoom piece so that we have a rotation and we have sufficient people who'd be able to cover that. Um, that's why we allocated two. Um, if we wanted to go down that route, that we'd at least have two people trained on doing that. And it's Exist also helpful existing to employees. Do. This would be for the public input on Zoom. Um, in the past, we had them um, in the back or in right. another room still on this campus. 
um, and they're communicating with the teams in the back um, with making sure we're getting the callers on, giving them direction, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right. So it does require a couple of folks to be back there doing it. And even though it's Zoom, we don't have a, if they wanted to come on, if they had a video, like you do with Zoom with someone, you got a camera on your computer, that doesn't happen. If Mr. Hunter wanted us to see his handsome face, you stay at home, but that, that can't happen, that he can't be on picture here like I am with colleagues or something? That one I'll check. We kept it on just voice because it was, um, uh, we just left it on voice because that made it uh, very consistent for all of the callers to stay on just the audio. And keeping to Zoom because that is what we're using um, for the overall broadcast. All right, they could st if we had both, they could choose to be on camera or not, right? That one I, w I would uh, want to confer with the team. Okay. I, sometimes folks at home are, have come here with charts and things, you know, so they could, I'm just saying, I, I don't know what the problem is with it, but if it is that way. My concern is that you will have the staff. That's, if, if we're gonna be short or we're, or we're getting too close to the edge, we can't do something and not do it well. We sure as heck can't do our messaging and not do it well. For all the reasons that Mr. Hunter was talking about for the, uh, our responsibility to the community, and I've talked about here for a long time, uh, but as well, the disruption of the public vote on items, that, and that includes the uh, consent. So, um, thank you. And you can tune in on YouTube, right? I understand. Yes, it is live stream. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Dr. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee, uh, and thank you, as, as Trustee uh, Hunt mentioned, this is a very good comprehensive analysis. So a few questions. Uh, to Trustee Hunt's point about that uh, bullet point that he mentioned, are you guys saying that even if we're meeting in person, if, if, the, if we were to do a virtual component, you're saying that it would it would trigger that situation so that it, we would have to have not only the, the staffing and make sure that there's stability, uh, that there's no you know issues with that, but that we'd have to have somebody observing the board meeting, you know, from a third party perspective. And if if they see, uh, uh, if, if, if they're not able to see it properly, that we would then immediately need to be notified and basically we would have to stop the meeting until that's restored. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? You could not take action until that was restored. You could go with your meeting. You, you could go through the agenda. We could agenda discuss item. it, but we wouldn't be able you to. You would not be able to take any votes. The, the, the whole idea of the setup of the beginning of this presentation was to give you a, um, a re, repeat understanding of the requirements of, of the virtual meeting. And part of the virtual meeting was that you had to have the ability for the public to give input. So when we were doing virtual meetings, the board was here, but, the, but everyone else participated virtually. Now that the board is here and the public can come, if you choose to move to a virtual participation by the public, that triggers the element of, a, of the uh, AB 361, which requires you to let them know how they can participate virtually and then in your agenda and then when they participate virtually, if it does not um, work, or if it goes down, or if you have a blackout in a certain area where people can't participate but they're online, you would not be able to take action on that. You'd have to push it to the next meeting. And so, so to be clear, though, it's not just for, like, because I know some neighboring school districts, they're, uh, they're not even meeting in person anymore, right? Is Moreno Valley one of them, I think? Or Moreno Valley is the program? only one in the in, in the empire that we um, spoke to that is still doing virtual meetings. Everyone else is in Cause, person. Because in that situation, time. to me, it's common sense. Like, if, if obviously, if the meeting is, 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 is not being transmitted and you're meet, only meeting virtually, then obviously you, you have to stop, you know, uh, in terms of being able to take an action or something. Yes. But, but you're, um, you don't have to reiterate, but you're saying that even if we're doing hybrid, that, that, const, that principle still applies. That's, that's correct. Okay, that's interesting. Um, my other question is, um, I'm pleased that, you know, when, when the district comparisons that, you know, uh, we're 
we're providing a lot of different options compared to the school districts. But my question, I guess, is the public input via Google Form. So this is a this is something we're doing right now, right? And this is something that even if somebody's not physically able to come here from the comfort of their home or whatever, and and there's not they can they have advanced time prior to even today, right? They they could do it the day before or, or whatever the case is. They can provide that input to us, and we do get that input, and we do review that. Um, my question regarding that is, is that, because when somebody comes here, uh, they, they fill out a card, it's, it's recorded in like the minutes, right? That, 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 that statement was made, uh, the, the summary of it. Is that the case for this public input via Google form? The, um, I'll have. Is it treated the same way that public, in terms of like the, the right it, now, what we're what we're taking in are e comments that yeah. come by email and they're they're captured by uh, Miss Martin and provided to the board uh, as we the, approach the board meeting. But isn't uh, that's not the same thing as I know? Google. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. have uh, Dr. Perez speak okay. to the Google. Uh, thank you, and I'm gonna make eye contact with um, uh, Miss Martin. Uh, those <laughs> currently are not recorded on the. <coughs> Um, public um, posting, is that correct, Ms. Martin? Okay, so they are still captured. So it, it is captured then? Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, that's Thank good. So I, I, that's, I wanted to confirm that that was consistent with that. Uh, and then my, uh, I, get, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I want to make sure other people. Um, question. So uh, I know we put the expenses up there because the board has to approve expenses. But was the staff implying that uh, it was going to be too expensive to do it didn't seem very costly. Staff, we were not implying right. anything. We just were factual and to I provide didn't take it that costs. way, but I just want to make sure that was the yeah. case. Um, and Dr. Farouk asked my question. It seems very odd that if you have a hybrid meeting that they would not let you take action if there was some issue. But, I mean, that's the way it is. I'm not doubting it, but it just seems kind of frustrating. I had this explored with legal yeah. prior to this meeting. It just seems so like a stupid, that, that's the stupid rule. Standard. Yeah, that'd be a stupid rule. Um, and then my other question is, if we could pull up that presentation again and to the slide where it compares other districts and what they're doing. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's on there. I don't have great eyes, but um, so I, if Merino Valley is the only one that's meeting virtually, are any of the other districts that are listed there taking or doing hybrid meetings or taking any any uh, public comment via Zoom or teleconference? Currently, as of date, when we captured the information um, last week, uh, no. No, okay. All right. Well, I mean, um, this will probably surprise Mr. Hunter, but I mean, I, I don't think he makes a bad argument um, in terms of trying to encourage more people in our community um, I think that's that's a good thing. Uh, obviously, you have to weigh that against some of the challenges that technology presents itself, and maybe tying our hands to making decisions that maybe may be timely. Um, and then, I mean, I, I think about some of the recent issues that we have had and had extensive public comment on, either by email or social media or whatever. Um, and we've we've received comments from people across not only the country but the world um, and I think that if we were to go in a direction of changing uh, if we could somehow overcome the technical challenge potential technical challenges that could cause us to not take action on some items um, some kind of time constraint because I mean if you have hundreds of people calling in on uh, for instance the, the, inc the incident we had with uh, the Native American uh, video uh, it could be problem. So it would be interesting to get some maybe some insight from some of these other districts about why they're not 
doing that, if it's, if it's some kind of a time issue, a technical issue, or what. But uh, I am pleased to see that our district is doing a lot. Um, I would like to see our Google Form um, 2.0, because I think that the intent of that was, when that idea came about, was to provide an avenue for people that didn't want to come or couldn't come for, for whatever reason. Uh, that to not only share their, their their comments and their concerns with the board, but to make sure the public is aware of their potential concerns. So I know that the city has an e-comment feature on their agenda. Um, and I know we've looked into it and maybe it doesn't quite work with our system, but if somehow we could make that Google form a public document so that, you know, if someone comes before us to speak on an, an item, it might only be recorded in the minutes as, you know, um, Dr. Perez spoke on item, whatever. Um, but then you could go back and watch the YouTube and see what Dr. Perez said on that item. So I think if we could have a similar feature on, on the Google Forms um, where not only is the board shared the topic that a certain commenter uh, made uh, on e-comment, but then the public could also, on, when they get their agenda, they could click on it and say, oh, I see Dr. Perez wasn't here, but she made a comment concerning this item as well. So I think. If there's a way we can do that, I think that would that would improve our current process. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, so, I you know I've stated before I, that I'm supportive of trying to create as much accessibility as possible. I I really like uh, Pre President Lee's suggestion about uh, uh, how we can create more transparency regarding the, the public input via Google Form because. I think um, one, whether it's like they could click on something and see it. The other thing is on the live stream, if there's a way where uh, like in the beginning of the live stream or at the end of it, they can, or they can know that always go to this part of the live stream and then you can see it written in written form. Because I do think it needs to be consistent, right? In terms of the quality of the be able to have the input. And, and even if in the minutes, it's, it's just saying the same thing as what they're saying here. But the difference is here, they're, see, they're, they're having recorded comments that they can watch, whereas they will never know what those public inputs are. Uh, I mean, what the actual state, state was. So I think, at a minimum, I, I really think, is it, is it, one, I'm assuming that's something feasible to do, right? That's not a big deal to, to do what, what President Lee's suggesting. You're suggesting, and I know we would capture all of it so we could, the team can work on what that would actually look like. In Both on the YouTube, there should be some way of people just knowing that, okay, when you click on this part of the YouTube page for any meeting, you can get uh, a, a, a list of all, all of the uh, e Google Form comments that were submitted, um, and, it, and then um, also something online. Uh, but with, with the virtual side, I, my only concern is like that if you have a technical problem, which anybody, no matter what, if you're a large corporation, it's possible to have this thing. We only meet, you know, once every three weeks, uh, an action item. We'd have to have an emergency meeting just to make up for a potential glitch or something. That's my my concern. And so, I, at a minimum, I think we should we should express that to our legislators that. By them having that we that strange effect that even if you're doing an in-person meeting that suddenly that would be halted, help, help they're actually they're disincentivizing accessibility, and I so I think uh, we should we should express that to our legislators uh, because that just doesn't make sense. And so I think this Google Form concept could potentially allow, as, as, as President Lee very well articulated. The bottom line is people need to be able to, on their own time, express their thoughts that we hear and is recorded for the public. I think at a minimum, if we're doing that, and we've, we've if you, you know, with all those other check marks associated with the different options, I think that's a step in the right direction. And again, I'm open to the virtual. I just want to see um, how that would be reconciled. All right, anybody else? Just quickly, I have a couple of questions. Thank you both for adding those really valuable input. Explain them to me later. And uh, but no, I know Google too is is would be good. And the more information uh, that we can put out, that they can look exactly what we see on the screen is important. I believe you're right, Dr. Farouk. It needs to be consistent. Yet 
equal. It needs to be reliable. Um, I, you know, again, the special meetings, and then what happens if we were to vote on something, and, and we're going to vote on whether it's going to be blue or green, then then the people in the blue were, were saying, you know, their advocacy or whatever, and the other ones didn't. So now everybody's got to come back, and because it's only on action items, and productive with the input. So I just want to be sure that uh, we can be consistent. Um, I'm, I'm not concerned about the, the cost. It's nonsensical to even worry about that. It's it's about the ability to keep, I mean, to attract, keep people that are trained like this. Because I know we lost half your staff last year to the county office of Ed. So, and I think one went to that way in Hollywood or something. You know, so there there are people that are, are in the need and out there, and I just want to be sure we can do this right. We shouldn't do it. We can't do it right. And. Uh, that's that's just the way I feel. I guess it's not an action tonight. Correct. Yeah, it's just a report. All right. So if there's nothing else, that will bring us to the conclusion of the meeting. Um, our next regular meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Thursday, February 3rd, uh, and will be called to order at 4 p.m. Um, and we'll, per normal, we'll go to our closed session, and then open session will begin again at 4, 5:30. <clears throat> But tonight, uh, we will adjourn in memory of Dr. Margaret Hill, who was a San Bernardino City Unified School District board member since 2011, really a giant 